What's oh. ear? What's ear sex? <laughs> <laughs> it's what? Okay, I have a procedure <laughs> with the Q-tip. Oh, okay. So I take the Q-tip and then I loosen the cotton and then I tighten the cotton and then I bring it in and I go to mm. loose cotton <laughs> and the loose cotton grabs all the little things, you know, ding, 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 and then just the feeling of it. Mm. I'll go till blood comes out. <laughs> oh. Don't okay. So sorry, <laughs> I've never gone to an ear doctor, but don't Q-tips like I love them too. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. don't they like push the shit in there? A it says bit? specifically yes. not to use them for that. That's a yeah. liability thing. They say do, Q, yes. on the package of oh, Q-tips, yeah. they oh, yeah. say it for your ears. Yes, yeah. correct. <laughs> wow, correct. they're making money, yo. Good for that, them. It's a liability thing. It's so that they don't get sued when some idiot. Pops their eardrum. Dude, I have a family friend that is a ear, nose, and throat doctor. <laughs> and I was telling him my ear was bothering me and this and that. He's like, oh, just, you know, come in. He came in. He took the oh. grossest shit and there's so much stuff oh. out of my ear. It was just nasty. I'm a, I'm a gross I know person. for sure I got some gremlins in there. Same here. Yeah. I've never gotten that done. I, I had some done. sort of, I don't know, I was having some sort of reaction to having like, uh, my excuse anyway. <laughs> Was I was having some sort of reaction just to like wearing headphones a lot, I think. Mm. Yeah, the little earbuds make my ears waxier. Yeah. So yeah. I don't wear those anymore. Like I had those Apple AirPods. Yeah, yeah, right. But I only use like the their AirPods Max mm. or yeah. something that goes over mm -hmm. here because yeah. it's, anything it's annoying. in there. It's annoying. It was like Shrek, you know, when he makes yep. a candle out of the earwax <laughs> that was in his ear. It was disgusting. <laughs> David Weck, thank you so much for coming back again. It's always good to have you here. Ooh. Yeah. I love coming up here. I love it. I love it. What were you doing with the runner in there today? Uh, we were talking about how to strategize um, to give him more options for one and to fundamentally balance the stride as sort of, you know, going back to that every step is a rep philosophy. Um, very open-minded and we connect because we both sort of have indulged in the weird, right? So we can go out there and sort of, draw things in that helps us do something mechanically better. And when somebody's talking about running as far as, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time remembering his name. Is it? Uh, Anthony. 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 Yeah. Anthony's run like 50 miles, 100 miles. Yes. And he was talking to you about how sometimes the stride and what you're going to try to hold on to for the entire length or duration of that run. And sometimes I think he's even done like running 24 hours straight. And yeah. Weird, yeah. crazy stuff right. like that. Right. So he was talking to you how that might look different than, uh, maybe this some of the stuff that you uh, originally got in into, which was probably the locomotion of some of the sprinters. Yes. Well, I mean, it, it, at, if you're going to go a super long distance, well, then you ha do have to mitigate that amplitude of vertical displacement. So there are strategies to sort of more roll through and keep yourself with less bounce if you're going to go for super, super long distances. A little bit of a granny, gram grandpa run. Yeah, you yeah know? Sort, just sort of. The arms are moving and it's kind of like almost like a walk. So, yeah, sort of, sort mm -hmm. of. And I think I like the principle of move without moving. So what I'm going to work on with him, I, we're going to make him faster and we're mm -hmm. going to make him feel better. This is going to be a really Yeah, he said fun he wants to try to set a world record, I think, for a 50-mile run or something like that. I think so, yeah. Okay. And he and, does like a 216 marathon time or something like that, which is wild. Yeah, and, and apparently he's right now ready. Like, even hurt. He's like, next weekend I could go run a, you know, a 215. <laughs> like, oh, really? So, I mean, you know, it takes... I think a lot of runners don't run for their body and their health. They run for their mind. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, especially at those distances. Yes. But, I mean, there's a lot of, like, you know, the person who runs, they have black toenails. They have plantar fasciitis. They are feeling, um, you know, pain. Mm -hmm. But they still have to go do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the thing that drives them mentally. And it feeds them in terms of their, their psychology, I think. For you, more recently, you've uh, you gotten into jiu-jitsu, and we can tackle some of that uh, in a little bit. But yep. also, um, I was encouraging you to mess around with like a little bit of running. I'm like, it'd be good, yes. since you're talking about this topic, I think it would be great for people to see you actually doing this and performing this. And I think I saw you run maybe like a 400 and... Uh, saw a couple other examples of you running, but you're running uh, a little bit here and there. You're also uh, you're also taking up jujitsu, but you're also yes. taking your diet more seriously, and you're just trying to improve kind of overall. Is that yeah. is that because you're in front of the camera more and you're trying to um, you're trying to get the WEC method delivered? You know, from uh, maybe a, a person that people recognize being proficient at certain things. Well, to be honest, there's a few people who do motivate me 
because I'm a guy I do pretty much whatever I want, but you and uh, particular Leo Santos are two guys who, and you need to roll with Leo. Leo Santos. Oh, he's yeah. the guy, he, yeah. he's from your jiu-jitsu school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for whatever reason, you know, someone else could say the same thing to me, but it doesn't impact and create a change. Whereas my relationship with you, I mean, I wake up every day and send him my body weight the first thing I do. Right? Yeah. Yeah, David had uh, an yeah. affliction with ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> we got what was it off, that you would eat? Yeah, we got oh, him off ice cream every day. I was eating, I have a very fast metabolism. So I was eating ridiculous amounts and, you know, like 24 ice cream popsicles or something. And then, you know, sort of the diabetic. It's like a little kid. <laughs> well, it feels good. It feels good. Yeah. You know, and once I, I've always, two gallons of milk, we are low on milk. Kind mm, of a thing, mm, right? Mm. And so with my son now, you saw him, yep. six feet tall, 14. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just constantly bringing raw milk into the house. <laughs> <laughs> raw milk. And hey, you want some, you know, I buy tri-tip. <laughs> like, you want some meat and milk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now steak shake. Yeah. So the steak shake with raw milk, and then you put ice mm. cubes in it. Kind of like ice cream. You put the, the ice cubes in it, just the right amount. You put the steak shake always... An extra scoop, what the hell? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you drink it out of the blender. Oh, like, yeah. that's how you're supposed to do it. Mm. <laughs> that, is, that is the way to do it. What is it about Leo? Because he's, he's, a new, he's new in your life because he's yeah. a jiu-jitsu well, instructor. But, yes. Oh, have you known him for a while? I've known him for a while, but now I interact with him all the time. And so why is he having such a great impact on you? Boy, um... I guess with some people, there are certain intangibles that would be hard to describe. Mm -hmm. um, he came from a football background. Um, he, um, he's a real student who wants to do it smarter all the time. Yeah. And his philosophy is, you know, movement, movement, movement. So he's not even so much the moves, but it's the movement. Is he older or younger? He's 45, 46 years old. Okay. A young guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Leo Santos. Mm. And he's from the Ribeiro lineage. Um, what are you able to bring to the table in terms of being able to teach some of these guys? Because I'd imagine some mm. of the, I mean, a lot of the information that you have yeah. is is probably beneficial when you get talking to some of these guys that have been doing jujitsu for many, many years. You're, yeah. not, uh, you're not highly skilled or highly trained in jujitsu yet. You're working on it. Right. Um, but I'd imagine you, with your knowledge base, you're able to bring some things to the table that they well, might not have thought of, thought of before. I have the distinct honor and privilege of, of uh, meeting the Ribeiros, both Shanji and Salo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you want to talk about lineage and you want to talk about legit, right? It doesn't, you know, that, that's as world class as it gets. And um, my first experience in jiu-jitsu was literally – privates with Salo. So you want to talk about like, wow. And at that time, I just wasn't interested in jujitsu because I don't, I'm not flexible. I didn't want to be on the ground. Like, eh, you know, I like running around more. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, just did three lessons and then it just sort of wavered off because I just didn't want to go deep then. Um, then my, my son got in trouble. And so, okay, well, let's do a little jujitsu. Right. Let's, let's, you know, get some discipline here. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that if I don't do it, well, how am I going to, you know, mm. do him doing it? And then I got the bug. So now I love it. Um, and I had the distinct honor of meeting both Salo and Shanji some years earlier before I even got on a mat or any jujitsu. And Shanji came into my gym, my old lab in 2016 or 17. Mm-hmm. And he ran very blocky, very, very blocky. So I taught him how to head over foot, taught him how to coil and run. And then I taught him the coiling core. And what he did was he enhanced his jujitsu to be able to pivot on a, on a smaller point. And so he improved his jujitsu based on coiling core training. And recently... What he, does that mean? Can you clear that up? What's <clears throat> pivoting on a smaller point mean? So... If you give a man a lever the right way, he can move the world. And the wheel 
you know, the, the, the edge spins real, real fast. If you are in the infinitesimal center, you only need to do that and the whole thing goes. So if you can find a more like precise point to pivot, everything will move easier. I think about like, for example, maybe when somebody's inverting and Andrew, if you pull up in inverting in jujitsu or inverting BJJ or whatever, like if somebody's going to invert on their back, it's, it's usually a movement where you like, you, you oh. do a spin on your back, but if you can hit that point quicker, mm. right? Because of like you, you have, have access to that coil. It could make sense that it's going to make certain movements more fluid. It, within that context. Yeah, yeah, very very similar to getting there fast. Yes, right, so there's that sort of the intent and the point of it and the relationship of the hips and shoulders. Mm -hmm. And what I learned in jiu-jitsu, see, up on top on when I'm standing up in SEMA, my shoulder movement and my upper body movement is gonna oftentimes precede the hip movement. So, yeah. so okay. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go here, mm -hmm. right, duck under here, right? And the hips didn't move as much as my upper body and then, boom, move the hips. Yeah. In jiu jitsu it's opposite. You got to you got to move the hips. So when I first started jiu jitsu I was moving my shoulders. <laughs> okay, we're not going anywhere, dude. Yeah. You got to move the hips out. And with the coil, it's the relationship of the hip and shoulder. And so what I was very good at was I was very good at sort of bringing my elbow in and then bringing my hip up to the elbow. Yep. So and because I could do that it's very hard for someone to get the you know, underhook. the underhook on me, mm -hmm. right? And then the choking, I'm very good at, like, you know. Yeah. I'm very good at being bad at jujitsu, <laughs> being choked, but not getting choked out. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you, and you hurt yourself early on, right, because of that? Yes, yes. I, you tried to resist and you well, what popped something, right? Yeah, what happened was, you know, it, and I consciously did it, you know, like Leo, another thing about Leo is just softer, softer softer right and then okay that's my intention and then okay you go hard <laughs> right so you need the constant reminder mm -hmm. but in my first um month in class i just wanted to see like i'm doing all these weird shit that's not even jujitsu like i'm like and and it was my first month we were in no gi okay yeah, so yeah. you can't stop me now like uh -huh. you know what i mean you grab me i'm like ah i can't do it but no gi yeah. That's fun, uh -huh. right? And if you try to risk control me, I'll move you around, mm -hmm. right? It's because I know how to play that, right? But um, I was just trying to survive, and I was trying to find out how tough I am, Yeah. right? You know, like, okay, I'm here. Okay, if you get a joint lock where you're going to, you know, arm bar me, I'll tap in a second, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not interested in the injury. But if you're going to choke me, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? I pass out? <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> right? I myself when I pass out, huh? Well, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, it, I, literally, I'm like, okay. So what I did was I got myself into a situation where I was like, okay, I'm not going to tap on a choke. Mm. And I'm very good at it. And Describe the, to people what you do. Because like when you say that, they're like, what? But yeah. what, what is it that you do? Because so, it's pretty interesting. So basically, I, I, I like, you know, you just had Alex on. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, the way Alex... The chin's down to, to yeah, the throat. The chin is low. Down and back. And I just met a guy last night who was telling me all about this, like, Hindu, you know, chin lock and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, you know more than me on this. I need to... <laughs> you're my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, what I do is I underbite mm -hmm. like this, and I clinch in, and I put in, like, that evil Joker smile like this, and I face the force. So That's a I'll great put <laughs> contortion of your face right there. Oh, I know. I can look crazy, right? It's same. I imagine somebody, yeah, that. that. <laughs> so when it, watch, watch it, watch this, watch, watch. Ready? I hurt myself a bit. Now yeah. watch this. You see this here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ready? Neck chops. It, it, now, do it without that weird stuff, without oh. lizard neck. Mm-hmm. Oh, that lizard. Yeah, neck. that's true. Like, yeah, that does that does hurt more. Everybody at home, if you're if you're watching this, try it. Do this, and then you know <laughs> hit yourself, and make then relax, sure you, and then hit yourself. It make hurts. sure you lizard neck first. <laughs> if you don't that's lizard, great, that's a great thing to do if someone wants to fight you. Be like, Ooh, yeah. boom, and then they're like, <laughs> okay, that guy's crazy. I'm yeah, not yeah, gonna yeah. fight no, him. No, seriously. So what I think of is if you smile, you can breathe easier through your nose. Okay, mm -hmm. try it. You'll mm -hmm. breathe easier through your nose if you put a big smile. Evil. Especially with the underbite. And then an underbite, mm -hmm. underbite, and you protect your air and your blood. And so what happens is, and see, what, 
<laughs> I just imagined like so trying strategy. to choke you, and then you just start doing this, like dude. <laughs> you put it back out. You yeah. just look scarier to me. <laughs> yeah, it's like it may not actually be working, but people are like, "This guy is crazy." Out of here. <laughs> so, in martial principle, is face the force. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to face the force. So what happens is, if you allow the guy to turn you, you're done. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. But. If he starts going over here, you have to then face the force there. So you have to get the vector right. Mm -hmm. So we can't get, if you get under, he's going to beat it's you. He's going to fuck you up. Yeah. Right. So you can't let him get under, under no circumstance. I can picture David going, I'm not tapping. I got the vector right. <laughs> In my mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what happened was I, you know, went at it and I was doing this stuff. And the professor of the school's awesome. And just the fact that black belts roll with white belts now yeah. is so cool. Yeah. Because that's what you want to be. Is you want to feel what it actually is. You don't mm -hmm. want to just fight against the guy. So the professor in the school, you know, I play standing up for and you know, he's just toying with me and, you know, giving me, you know, give give and take a little bit. Yeah. But generally speaking, in the six minutes, he's gonna tap whoever he's rolling with. Mm -hmm. Right? Generally speaking. I, I think he taps everybody. Yeah. Right? And he taps me. So this particular time, it wasn't any kind of an arm bar or anything. It was a choke where he was behind me and he was wrapping my rib cage with his legs. Yeah. Okay. Body work. And I had my guard, right? <laughs> and there were like two minutes, two minutes of like, I just, you know, I was thinking I'm not going to tap. Like, I don't need But also, he was never able to get underneath it. He that. never got underneath That's it. That's a big deal. Never yeah. got underneath it. And so, for me, it's like, okay, can I survive, right? Salo said in the beginning, just survive as a white belt. Mm -hmm. So, I was there, right? And we made it to six minutes, and I got my collarbone dislocated. Uh -oh. <laughs> but my, you didn't get choked. And, <laughs> And my ribs I were- I can't come back for six weeks, yeah, but I didn't get you. I didn't. My, my, ribs, my ribs were hurting for a long time, uh -huh, too. And what I said when I got up is I said, just in time for my friends to get here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if, I'm not dead in six minutes, and now yeah. my buddies are here, they're going to pull you off me. Yeah. So that was sort of the mindset. A really cool thing, though, that if there are any jujitsu people listening, they're like, ah, bullshit or whatever. They're, you know, in jujitsu, like, if somebody does take your back and they're choking, they always do tell you, do this, right? But the thing you're talking about with the neck and the other, the, the, that stuff, that will make a big difference. A huge difference. And that's coming from the outside. Like, this is something like, you weren't doing jujitsu before, but this is just a concept that you kept in mind. You bring it in and yes. this guy can't tap you for a few minutes. Well, let's put it this way. If he had tried to do a different move, he oh, yeah. could have tapped me. Absolutely. So I want to be clear to all the people out there that he could tap me. He can tap me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah no. We, so we understand <laughs> right, that, but right. this is the thing. If somebody yes. has your back or they're trying to choke you and you, yes. you can do that, that'll give you some time to maybe do something else. You're not immediately going to get tapped. It, and that's like, time cool. for your Time for your friends to show up. Yeah, and in, in our you know own situation, I mean? yeah. Like that, I just, I always play scenarios. Yeah. Right? Let's, and I was an actor, and as an actor, you're trained to raise the stakes. It's a pretty boring scene if there's nothing happening and there's nothing at stake. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you raise the stakes, and life and death are pretty, pretty high stakes. Yeah. Right? So I think about, okay, well, how am I going to protect myself from getting choked? And this kind of idea also, these are weapons. Mm -hmm. This is a weapon. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, if I come in and I know how to, like, do all this stuff, I'm going to you know, I'm bony. Yeah. So standing up, I feel, I think you'd have to be a, a very good fighter, like a Div 1 wrestler guy or like an MMA guy for real, like a boxer. Uh -huh. Otherwise, I think I'm going to give you problems. I just feel that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, it's just okay. Yeah. It, and I'm not a badass, but I have trained this and trained this and trained this, and I am bony and kitty got claws. <laughs> Okay, and yeah, I'm not going to fight fair either. Yep. <laughs> so, just so you know, <laughs> if it's on, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not conditioned to say, okay, ready, tap. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it, it, it's just it's something that I do psychologically to make me feel at ease. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about some of your inventions, and I want to go way, way back and start to talk about how you kind of landed on these things. Because inventing a product... Uh, is, is a really interesting thing to have uh, another patent holder on the show 
doesn't happen all the time. Um, how, how did some ideas start working in that direction of creating the BOSU ball and then all the other things you're creating? Like now it seems like you're on fire and you're just creating, you're working on creating so much. Yes. Yeah. Where, where did some of this like come from? Do you feel like you've been creative most of your life? Yeah, I was always creative my whole life. And sort of back in the day, you know, I'm 53, 1970, baby. So, you know, you were dealing with your hands in some mechanical capacity. And I did the BMX bicycles. I ride them in mud and dirt and water and stuff. So you'd have to take it apart. And, you know, oh, I'm too, I don't have enough money to fix or to buy new three-piece uh, cranks. So I'm going to take this Coke can, I'm going to cut it here, and I'm going to wrap it around that thing, and I'm going to jam it on so that, you know, my my thing doesn't slip. I remember it was a big deal getting the pegs on my BMX bike. Mm. <laughs> the pegs on the back yeah. that you could stand on. That was before my era. You know what I mean? Like, it came mm. later, but, right. you know, for, you know, I, when I was a kid, skateboarding in a swimming pool was new. All, oh, you all, mean like all, an empty pool? Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, you, all you did I mean, when I was a kid, if you could do a 360 and tack your way up a hill and slalom down, that mm -hmm. was sort of like, oh, you can skateboard. Yeah. And it's just, you know, just, boom, it just hit the thing where little monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. I'm going to top that. That's possible. But so I was always creative in solving problems. And then when I was acting and personal training to make a living, mm -hmm. so... At that point, what I did was I would go around and do in-home sessions. Money's much better. Yeah. Right? And I had a, a, a broom handle that I got from Home Depot, put athletic tape around it, and I cut out a center. And so, you know, I had the center of the bar. I had a towel, a uh, couple, like, elastic bands. Um, and then, like, I went and got a water skiing handle mm -hmm. that I, you know, strap on the door like a TRX kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so I was always just improvising into, and I would like, if I would do all these weird body things where I'm, you know, resisting, you know, and like doing this, getting a leverage position. Okay. And so it's just about making do and being creative to, you know, give a good experience and a great workout without having to carry weights. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there was that. Um, and then when I did the BOSU ball, that was just a lucky accident. You know, one of those flash of inspiration. I fell off a ball standing there. It was the New York Knicks were playing in the finals. They lost the game. And I closed my eyes to do this minimalist thing on a ball. And I tilt my head to upset the vestibular. And I, before I knew it, I flipped over. I landed on a ball and I landed like a backflip across in the, in the kitchen. And uh -huh. I was in the living room. I was in the den, a 200 square foot studio. Yeah. And... I started kicking my feet to make sure I could still do it because I was so terrified of that lack of control and hitting my neck because I mm -hmm. landed on my neck. And that night, I thought, like, well, what am I going to do here? My back is getting better. My feet are getting strong, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what if I cut the ball in half? And it was just like, bang, like, mother. And it was the dot-com era. Yeah. So money. Like, How old were you? I was 29. Okay. Yeah, 29. And 1999. Mm -hmm. And literally, I quit acting in that moment. Okay, I called my agent. It was sat it was a Friday night, so mm -hmm. I had Saturday and Sunday. But Monday morning, I thought, listen, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to go make some money. And I knew what I had in the concept. So literally, the next day. So this is 1 a.m., twelve between 12 and 1, when I think, what if I cut the ball in half? I'm on the first train out to New Jersey the next day, Home Depot, you know, half hour later, and I'm in my father's, you know, backyard on the picnic table, cutting the ball in half and strapping it around a, a, a pine tabletop that's round and stapling it and gluing it and stuff. Mm -hmm. Next day, you know, blew it up. I was like, holy shit, this thing is fantastic. There's just so many things you could do with it. And the innovation, which I recognized right away, was that it's actually stable. Mm. Right, so most people intuitively would say, oh, the BOSU ball, you're supposed to use it with the platform up and balance on it. But I knew, no, no, the secret sauce is on the dome. Yeah. And you, if you can jump on it multiple times body weight and jump a rope on it and pound <clears throat> on it, well, it's stable. It's an undulating, compressive surface that's elastic, and elastic is such a special training Jumping substance. on a bed a little bit. Right. It's a trampoline that, yeah. that doesn't pull you to the center. It's a trampoline mm. that wants to take you out of center. And so you're not getting inversion with the feet. You're getting that supination, 
right? So you're not pronating in on a trampoline. You know, if you jump on a trampoline too much, you get sort of sore where your feet went like that all the time. Well, this thing does it like that. And, and athletically speaking, I want to be here to there. I want to be here to there. I don't want to be here to here athletically, mm-hmm. right? So, and I didn't know all that stuff um, consciously in the manner that I understand it now in terms of biomechanics, but I had good instincts. And I knew, like, when I played football in college, I had to tape my ankles every practice, every game, because I had trick ankles that were going to twist on me like that. So... The Bosu ball made me bulletproof. And then I played basketball. I'm like, I don't got to worry about my ankles anymore Hmm. because they just got smart and strong. Half the reason why you twist your ankle is because it dangled a millimeter out of position and then you swept across. It got caught and you twisted it. So you could have avoided the whole thing by just not being a millimeter off, you know, Hmm. when you're moving. Yeah. Right? Power Project family, if you're trying to increase your muscle mass, if you're trying to lose body fat, if you're trying to stick to your nutrition plan, if you're trying to get fit, pretty much if there's anything you're trying to do for your health, we know that sleep is the biggest determining factor to help you get from point A to point B. That's why we've been sleeping on eight sleep mattresses for probably more than two years now. And the main reason is the technology behind the Pod Pro. Now, the Pod Pro is like the Tesla of beds. It will change its temperature based off of how you're sleeping during the night. And if you have a partner that's sleeping on the other side, they can have their own temperature settings. We all sleep hot here and I used to wake up in a puddle of my own sweat. That doesn't happen anymore because of the eight sleep mattress and I've been getting the best sleep of my life. Now, if you don't want to replace your mattress, you can just get the Pod Pro cover and you can put that over your current mattress to get all the benefits of eight sleep. But if you also need to replace your old nasty mattress, (laughs) you can get the Pod Pro cover and the eight sleep mattress. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you guys got to head over to eightsleep.com slash power project and you guys will automatically receive $150 off of your order. Uh, again, 8sleep.com slash power project links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. So that, and then inventors often have like the sophomore slump, right? So you, the Bosu Bowl, mm-hmm. that's a grand slam, right? And I knew it would be, I was, that's my financial future. I'm going to hit the American dream. I'll be able to do whatever I want and not have to go to work is the idea, Mm -hmm. right? And it essentially did that. So um, the next invention that I made was, I called it the quick hands bola trainer. And it was an elastic cord, like shock cord, and then two balls. And what had happened, the way I invented it was I was in my, uh, I'd moved to San Diego and I'm in this condo on the beach and I, I took a hacky sack and I taped it onto an elastic cord that I just happened to have. And I was playing with penduluming. So like arcing and catching and sort of balancing with that visual and vestibular stimulation to boom. And what I found myself doing was I would do it and I would boom, I'd bounce it up and catch it. Mm -hmm. And that became what I fascinated. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Look at that. (laughs) It's like, it's just a, it's a toy that I used as a training tool. And I put, we put a speed gun on that thing. I could make it go faster than 110 miles an hour of Damn. snapping that thing back and then bring it, you see, like, just what bing, ma- bing, bing. What, uh, what drove you to think of this one? Because this is... Um, it's a cat toy. Yeah, it's, uh, but it's like, you know, you're, cool. in the, you know, you're in the gym space a bit and you're mm. a trainer and we don't really see a lot of reaction time, uh, reaction stuff in the gym most of the time, or reflex stuff, I should say. You don't see a lot of reflex stuff in the gym. It's usually just like lifting. So how do you kind of well, I, I come up with this weirdness? What I like is, is by this time I had started gaining some interest in the martial art. And so if your hands are fast and coordinated, so a, a lot of times what I would do with it is I would take, and that's the beginning of rolling ropes right there. Yeah, yeah. Rope, flow. The rope flow started with that. And I had play, and I had been training with a staff before this. So you can see it's just, you know, and, and seems like fun. If you're good at it, it's fun. And so, and I have the tenacity to get good at it. By the way, for anyone listening who's like, oh, this is, again, because there's some people like, oh, this is bullshit. We had Louisa Nicolon, who's like, a, she does neuroathletics with athletes. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that she does and a lot of other people do is they have athletes train with tennis balls, train the reaction, catching tennis balls, throwing tennis balls off a wall and doing yeah. different stuff. And when you look at this, there's a lot more variability because of the two balls and there's a like lot more creative things you can do with this. So this was kind of ahead of its time in terms of co- in concept. Well, what, what it did was, you know how in Rocky, he bounces a ball, he's walking around on the docks, breaking thumbs mm-hmm. and he's bouncing a ball, bouncing a ball. 
this you don't got to get your hands all dirty with dog shit with this thing, <laughs> right it doesn't hit the ground right and you have the feedback of one hand commanding to the other hand so you you there is a coordination where you can direct where it's going so you mm -hmm. could get good enough to do this with your eyes closed whereas a tennis ball you could never Sort of, right. somebody throws a tennis ball at your eyes closed, you don't have the sense of where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So this thing is developing the eye-hand coordination in the meantime, and then the control and communication of it. And one of the things I would do with it is I would take it here, and I'd fling it out there, and then I'd catch it right here. So intercepting fist. Yeah. He's throwing a punch, like, boom. You see what I mean? And mm -hmm. when the thing's coming 100 miles an hour at you, you're not messing around. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now suddenly it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> right? So I always cared about my prowess and I'm not big. I'm not fast. I'm not strong. I'm not flexible. So you got to be smart, right? And so that was a tool. And it's a cat toy. You get reflexes that are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, and you drop some pink, you catch it, no problem. Yeah. You know, so there is a carryover to it. The issue with it is that it's very skill-based. So... The athlete sort of, you know, in season doesn't have time to do that, you know, level of proficiency. And yo-yo, Duncan yo-yo, they have sold hundreds of millions of yo-yos. If Duncan were to have invented his yo-yo today, it would fall flat on its face. True. Because you're competing against the computer mm -hmm. and there's a skill base to a yo-yo. Mm -hmm. So literally it's a relic that you get, it, you get a shitty one in your stocking that doesn't even work, okay? Because that's what most yo-yos are. But there's, you know, there's a whole contingent of people who do yo-yos and are doing, like, the most amazing things with them. I remember when I was in school, we had a yo-yo guy that came to, like, a little it assembly. Went to everybody's Duh, school, yeah. yeah. We bought Everyone's those yo-yos. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and that's... that's <laughs> they got everybody. The cool kid with <laughs> the yo-yo. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's fewer and further between now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Because yeah. it's just, it's too skill-based. Mm -hmm. But So anyway, I thought that that thing was amazing, and I, you know, okay, invented that. I tried to push that. I went to juggling conventions and stuff. Like, and, you know, I... It took me forever to move 2,500 of them. So I was like, okay, this is not worth the effort because, you know, the turn on inventory has mm -hmm. to be a certain time frame. That's important to recognize that something didn't work. Yes, yes. And so that there's that. And then what I think – now my inventions are – they always stem from – like the RMT club is a great idea of, of like for the invention – Mm -hmm. I collected Indian clubs. And if I like something, I go overboard. So I had, you know, every kind of club. I had antiques. I had heavy ones, light ones, you know, single ones, you know. Indian clubs are awesome. I just found out about that recently, the past yeah. few months. And they, they've, they've done a lot of stuff with well, those. The, the Indian club, I mean, it's, it's, it's primal. Yeah. You, it's, it's a stick, a stone, and a rope. That's the first three. Mm -hmm. Add fire, add the dogs of war, add the secrets of plants, and bingo, iPhones and whatever. <laughs> mm. Seriously, that's what got us started. Yeah. And so the club is so primal and basic, and it's a there's there's a elongation with it. It's not compressive. Mm -hmm. You're expansive, mm -hmm. right? And so an Indian club is a wonderful tool. And I had all different shapes, all different sizes, all different weights. And the shortcoming for me was like. I want to move something so fast, right? And so, and then, and then the having the percussion inside of it was to give it weight. But then the discovery was like, oh my gosh, there's a shift in a percussive that then later turned into the propulsors, same mm. concepts, right? And my first propulsor prototype was material from an RMT club that I put into a thing and you said, oh my God. And I was just like, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah. Because making money excites me, <laughs> right? It does. <laughs> and I'm not a money guy. Yeah. Right? You, you see this, I'm wearing this because it was a, a Christmas present. Uh-huh. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be a branded t-shirt <laughs> like this underneath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so the uh, RMT Club is a great example of it's a tool in a category that is timeless. It is primal. It is basic but it gives you an advantage in terms of speed that you can do. You can swing that thing faster than any other club. Oh, yeah. Any other club. And you can percuss yourself with it, too, without hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. One of the demos I do is if you, if you attack it with your thigh and you, like, press your thigh in the ground and you make your thigh muscle, I can smash myself with it because it acts like a dead hammer. Mm. 
it hits, then the weight hits. Ah, yeah, yeah, It yeah. takes all mm. the sting out. Mm-hmm. You know, a carpenter has that dead hammer where they bink, and, and so it doesn't bounce off. It hit, hit, mm. hit, hit, right? And so there, it, it's just a great tool. Uh, How did you start to look at the body in these unique ways? Do you think, you've mentioned to me several times that you've had mental health issues over the years. Do you think that the combination of maybe the mental health issues and your interest in, spo- in like sports and fitness maybe allowed you to not have a governor on your thoughts and maybe allowed you to think differently than most people? I think I'm going to track it back to sort of um, the, the desire to succeed and be the best. I was the first child of a father who didn't want to live vicariously through me. He wanted, you know, he, he wanted me to be the king. You know what I mean? So he traded me, I, you know, the first 18 months of my life, the world revolved around me. And I think I liked that a lot. Mm. You know, when I was six years old, I lost a foot race and it was like, wait a minute, this doesn't compute. Like, what the hell? Like, I'm the best. I don't lose. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And so I always had like, like that type A attitude where I have to win. I'm not happy if I don't win. And I don't want to be consoled if I lose. I want to win. So I had to figure out what the hell I could You'll win. You'll get them next time. Yeah, yeah right. You're like, oh, what? it's okay. You know, well, it, no. Fucking Vince Lombardi <laughs> winning. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the only thing, right? Bill Parcells, points on the board. The answer to who won second place in the 100-meter dash is not I don't know. It's I don't give a fuck, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> Am I wrong? When we boil down to it. Mm-hmm. You either catch the rabbit and your family lives or you don't and you die. Yeah. Okay, if we're going to talk about it. So what I did was I quickly, you know, I found out that I was not the best at anything compared to someone else is better than me at every single category on the planet, Mm. right? So I just reconciled that, okay, you know, I'm going to play football and I'm going to take it as seriously so that I can be the best that I can be. And messing up was my fear. Like, you know, I, I would, I would be so OCD during football season because I felt as though like if I mess up, it's, you know, I have to do everything. Every second of my life is dominated by like, I had to ascend stairs where, where I always landed on my right foot, two steps up. So by the entire high school, I knew just instantly which foot to hit and how to do it to land where I had to land. If I didn't land, it was like some people can't step on a crack. <laughs> mm-hmm. I could not get upstairs without landing on a right foot from two steps, no matter what. And, you know, and, and I got good at it, right? Mm-hmm. So in order to deal with that pressure, the pressure, alcohol was my release valve. Uh. So ever since I was 13 years old, I would, every Saturday, like every Friday, Saturday, I was 13 years old, just drink till you're drunk. And without missing a weekend, like that, you know what I mean? Like, wow. I drank and I drank. And when I drank, I would just release the beast. All inhibition would disappear. And I, you know, and then I was, you know, I'm sort of the crazy guy, right? And... In high school, I kept enough under wraps that I was captain of the football team and I was a leader because in the weight room, you know, I was the most dedicated kind of guy, right? And that's who you want as your captain in football. Yeah. Is the guy who's going to, you know, keep it all in line. You're, everybody's going to work hard, right? You know, you're going you're gonna to give a problem to the kid who's a problem. Um, but in college, I sort of like, I was no longer that captain material. I was more of like the crazy material and they called me the weck man and it would get me fired up because you know in college you're just drinking even more oh yeah walkman weckman okay yeah well i was like yeah they'll, they'll, hey yeah. wow you just connected a dot for me head over <laughs> foot man <laughs> <laughs> so anyway the drinking was just my thing and i grew up on the east coast where you know early's on time and pot was for losers and burnouts during the time that I was growing up. Mm. And so I just stayed away from that pretty much. Um, you know, tried a couple times kind of thing. But then I moved out to San Diego. So 13 to 30, I was a drinker. And in New York City, when I was you know, living in my 20s, six drinks a day was routine. I would mm. smoke a cigar at night. So I'm not, I don't call myself a fitness guy. Yeah. Right? You know, life is too short. So when I moved to San Diego... I started seeing like successful people were smoking pot. Mm. And that to me was like, oh, wait a minute. You drive a Lexus. You're a lawyer. Like, you know, you smoke every night? Really? Huh. 
Hmm, interesting. <laughs> Take note. So then I started to dabble in the THC. And let me tell you something. THC. I have very, very peculiar reaction to THC because THC, mm, like, <laughs> like, like, uh, yeah. it, like I can, like I can, I, oh, I can conjure it up. <laughs> it hits you differently. Makes you float. It makes me radiate. And the Kundalini, right? That little, you know, it just like it would just mm, surface. And I would have so much energy, hmm. so much energy and sensitivity, like jujitsu. A lot of guys like the bake and roll. Yep. Because yep. they could feel, mm -hmm. right? So the Tai Chi that I play, right? The stand up game that I play where I'm soft and you're not going to find my center. So you're bigger than me. Okay, fine. You're not going to control me. Mm. And if I got two sticks that don't let you control me, but then I'll just move and then bang. It ain't football where I have to move you. I can yield, right? So I just, and I had the wherewithal, I invented the Bosu ball. Yeah. You don't got to show up at work at 8 a.m. All clean cut. <laughs> and so I literally went overboard. How overboard are we talking? What do you mean you went overboard? You're just smoking every day? Saturation. 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 So there were some weeks when I probably spent Two thousand dollars, like concentrates and hash oils, and like just. Oh, so you were always high, for periods. For yes, for like small periods, you were just like yeah, decent periods. Whoa. Yeah, like I'm talking sixty dollars a hash oil in a pot of black coffee, and that's five a.m. Right. Wow. Then another. Mm. And this is partly due to maybe you don't have as much responsibility because you created correct. the Bosu ball at the yeah, time. Yeah, correct. Yeah, freedom. so it gave me the freedom and the leeway to do it, and. I was making huge progress in terms of my understanding of movement and martial, like huge progress. And I knew because I was playing with people and seeing, okay, the game of push hands I play is who can move the other man, mm -hmm. right? Go. With certain rules, you attenuate it so that there's never damage. Yeah. Never damage. And who's better? And I found, I went through everybody in San Diego I could find in the Tai Chi world. And then this guy shows up to a little push hands in the park and he lifts me and moves me three feet in the air and i'm just like oh we're gonna play <laughs> you know what i mean because that's what you want in jujitsu that's what happened to leo santos was mm -hmm. he found shanji big football guy you know blue belt walking through people and you know and then he gets up and up and then he goes to shanji like oh <laughs> skill trumps that stuff yeah right so i found this guy and he was bigger than me and he was far better than me and so I just, you know, I download. If I touch you, I know what you're doing. And if I'm juiced on my THC, well, now I can feel everything. Yeah. Right? And so I got to the point where, you know, he couldn't move me anymore. Right? And we loved playing together because it was a challenge. It was fun. Mm. Right? So high-level basketball kind of thing. And the THC would bring me to places mentally where it would start to spiral out. And I have a, a very high level intellect, I think, right? So if I put my mind to something, I have a high powered brain. I could speed read incredibly fast when I focused on that. Mm -hmm. You know, do the little Mensa thing on the, you know, would you like to join the club? You know, just, I have a good brain. Yeah. And so what it did was it started going to stuff and the, the mystery and the ethereal. And we're finding out stuff now where you think Darwin's theory is really what happened? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like Cram Cambrian explosion, all these phylums show up and you got to, like, one amino acid has to randomly mutate and now what happens to the other 20 plus of them? And then we're here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, huh. okay. Dragonfly. Hey, we're related. <laughs> Hi, brother. You know, so I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And now I have no fear of entertaining any thought because it's just a device to diesel genes, strategy for living. Yeah. And if anything can make me have a better result in the here and now, then that's what I'm interested in. So quick question. Right? When you did say it made you spiral, like, what do you mean? Like, you just started going down rabbit holes you weren't expecting to go down? And was that a positive thing? But well, what do you mean by spiraling? So, so basically the clinical term or one, of, one clinical term for one thing that I experienced was ideas of reference. Ideas of reference are basically when you interpret acts out and about to correlate and relate to you and your story, mm. okay? 
So you're here at the diner and they're talking over there, and but they're talking about something that has to do with you. And the bird just landed there and the license plate number. And oh my God, like it starts to become sort of a beautiful mind. The, the, the movie, The Game with Sean so Penn. Kind of like some paranoia? Complete and total paranoia that is exhilarating for a time. Mm. And then it encloses in upon you and it becomes just, I couldn't go to sleep for like six days. Damn. And, you know, you, you'll spin out just from that alone. Mm -hmm. But, and I remember my brother came to help me. He, you know, brought me to this resort. Like, okay, we're just going to take you out of your environment, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I remember like, okay, finally, like six days, like I can finally go to sleep. And I close my eyes and I had the capacity to move my eyes with like, I could do cardinal and intercardinal and I could move them with such speed and control that it was like, boom, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, that feeling of like, oh, the Nietzschean Superman. And so, and that was the night when they brought me to the hospital and just boom, tranquilized me. Mm. Um, and, and then the bout of depression coming out of that intense manic state, yeah. you're in the depths of despair. And I was never suicidal, but I was, um, if I were in the crosswalk and the bus were coming, I wouldn't have jumped, okay? Mm. But I wouldn't have pulled the trigger, but if you're pointing the gun, go ahead. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's where I was. And people were probably really worried about you. Oh, my family. I, I mean, I have amazing family, amazing friends, amazing doctor. I have, I have the same psychiatrist as Dominic Cruz. And Dominic Cruz is on Joe Rogan talking about, you know, mm -hmm. Michael, Michael Larden. And Michael Larden is a guy who, he's my, he's my psychiatrist, but he's also my primary physician. Mm. Hey, you know, I, got, I got this. Who do I go to? You know, hey, you know, I'm getting Merrick blood work. You know, I'm going to send it to you too. You know what I mean? So he's sort of my right-hand man. And he works with high-level athletes who, you know, you have to putt a ball. And if you putt it in, you get to wear a green jacket. And if you don't, you're working at a country club. Mm. You know, we're high stakes. So he's a high-performance doctor. And he is a results rules guy. And so I'm sort of a special case with him. We have a special relationship that is still professional, so we don't come over and cook hamburgers because that would sort of cross the line. But it's a very unique and special relationship where he has been my go-to guy. Um, and I've had the spin-outs where I've had the, the, the crazy experiences. Like one time, <laughs> I'm running down the street naked, thinking, okay, the dogs are on one side, the cats are on the other, and is this, and is it like complete, there's a helicopter, you know, remember in like Goodfellas where you're like looking at the helicopter? So <laughs> this is happening. Mm -hmm. Five police officers or whatever are like, you know, surrounding me with tasers. Uh -huh. And and like, okay, okay. And I could tell what they were going to say before they said it. And I'm not saying that this happened. I'm saying that my perception, which was happening for me. So you were dreaming. No, no. I, no, this was happening, but oh, I could tell what they were, I was ahead. I was ahead. Mm. And I've had experiences where I'm like, okay, the sound, the ambient noise is bothering me. Mm. And it goes away. I've had this experience where I walk in the room and the TV set turns on. <clears throat> like, what the hell? You know what I mean? So, and I've had experiences where. When you were uh, running down the street naked, was that THC too? It was always THC. Oh. THC. I've never done anything harder than THC. And now, who knows what it's laced with, maybe? Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know, but I think it's just certain strains, and it's become a long way. Yeah. Because I remember when I was doing THC, and then I was sort of like went to the vaporization, you know what I mean? The vape pens? Yeah, the pens. Oh, yeah. You know, like that stuff, like occasionally I would find a strain that just hit the sweet spot, like American Beauty. Remember Kevin Spacey and the guy's like, here, this one's four grand. Here's 400, here's 400, here's four grand. Mm. I'll take the four grand. So that, you know, I'd find something like that and I'd be like, Ooh. and I'd buy tons of it, you know? Yeah. Because I had the resources to do it. Yeah. And saturation's a bitch because now you're all, I was always chasing tolerance. Mm hmm. You and probably had a crazy high tolerance. Oh, enormous. Yeah. And, what ends up having is saturation means that you can no longer chase it. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're flush with it, and now it's just, oh, you're stuck. 
like I want it, but more won't do it. And, uh, and then, you know, it's a, it's a year, two year process to wind up in that saturate point. Yeah. But, um, yeah, now I don't do it. And strategically, um, I feel as though it's fire that I cooked with. It's fire that burned me. I've forged some things that I don't think I would understand or know without it. So there's the good. Mm -hmm. I'm divorced, you know, happily divorced, but, you know, the marriage was sacrificed for it because, you know, living with that is, would be too much, mm. right? So, um, and just the pain and, and, and all that stuff I put people through, you know, who care about me. Um, so now I feel as though the equanimity, right? Mm -hmm. You said that word to me. Because where I want to get to, I have to win. So that's still true. Like if I don't win, I'm not happy. Yeah. But I do feel as though the zeitgeist in the sports conditioning, sports training, exercise, you know, fitness world, mm -hmm. I think the zeitgeist is now changing. And I think I'm the pivotal key mover in the idea that, look, we're going to relate to gate the right way. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to be all this brace core, stiff science study bullshit. We're going to go head over foot. We're going to be big cat for real. And that, it's like the Fosbury flop and the high jump. You do the technique, you jump higher over bars higher. Took eight years for the experts back in that day to accept the fact that this is in fact, right? They held on and cling to their expertise, which was not correct. How many people high jump? How many people walk? And so I do still connect to the insanity where I developed a, a, a cipher system where I can take mathematics, not two plus two is four, but two plus two plus, let's put it this way. Once you get into double integers, like 13, that equals four. You reduce down to a single integer. Rewind. What? So, so, so it's a form of math where you're reducing the number always to a value between one and nine. Okay. So you never get, if 11 turns into two. Yeah. Right? So 12 turns into three. <clears throat> okay. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is, yeah, so, yeah. And, and I did that, right? And I, and I used the, I've borrowed from all over parts, but I created a cipher where the alphabet is divided into 13 letters and 13 letters, A through M, N through Z, it's one, seven in the middle on G, and one on M. So it's one, seven, one. My birthday, one, one, seven. Mm -hmm. David and Goliath, one, one, seven. San Diego Longitude, one, one, seven. And what I do is I phonetically manipulate the words to fit a narrative that makes me feel special and informs me. So I say the ones, one, heaven, right? You know what's interesting? Because like... I'm going to be real. I'm confused with some of this. Yeah, sure. But the interesting thing is what I'm, what I'm catching is you're very, very good at finding patterns. Just yes. like, for example, right. when you taught us like the, like Deion Sanders and the way he double pumps, right? And then you made a product that could help somebody yes. tune in to that pattern. Right. You are extremely good at finding patterns in general, but then yes. human patterns of movement and then helping people figure out how to actually train that. Yes. Because- yes. If That's some a, a, people didn't you. have that tool, like for right. example, if some people didn't have that tool to be able to hear that, then it. they couldn't be able to replicate the way that run feels. And thank you for saying that because it is pattern recognition. And so what I'm doing is I manipulate the, like, for example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm -hmm. right? The New Testament. So what I say for me is I say math. You mark, look, and join. Hmm. One plus three is four, right? Yeah. Okay. Four plus nine is 13 is four. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the You see what I'm saying? Nine. Yes, yes, yes. I see so math, yeah. you mark, you look, and you join. And so I use that, and that's the new test. Amen. <laughs> I that. So, so that's sort of, it's just a game I play. Mm -hmm. And when I was crazy or in the process of mania, what would happen is I could literally double track. 
So I could be coherent in this reality right here, and at the same exact time, I could have this whole other narrative going at the same time. I could juggle both of them. Yeah. So I could take anything that you you blinked you blinked with your left eye, right? Like, oh, well, that means this. <laughs> so it was like this very um, electrifying sense of purpose, mm-hmm. right? To make myself feel special. Yeah. Right. To make myself the center of the universe. Right. And the way that I make sense of it now is I think God can drop in and look at it through anybody's eyes. I think he can. Mm-hmm. I think he does. How did you get yourself to be healthier from a mental health standpoint? I take uh, Western pharmaceutical medicine. So I take something that's an You've been SS- doing that for a few years? Yes. Yeah, many years. I take uh, something called Lamotrigine, which is a stabilizer. I'd imagine it took you a little while to find correct medication. Well, that's why Michael Larden's so good. Mm. Because at first I went to some you're just random person, you know, how do you find a psychiatrist, right? Yeah. She prescribed me stuff that, you know, Zyprexa and put me underwater and lithium put me made me feel like all like bloated and stuff. So it's just like awful. Mm-hmm. I'd rather not take it. I'd rather be crazy. So because I have to feel good. And so Michael Larden can, can dial in the medication to, to a T where, and my rule is, I don't want to know I'm taking it. Yeah. Right? As long as I don't feel it and I feel good, then we're good. The instant I feel it and I don't feel good, well, I'm done. I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. So I take a Lamotrigine, which is a stabilizer, and I take a Desvenlafaxin, which is an SSRI, which basically is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor so my brain doesn't soak up the serotonin. It lets it gestate there. And that's one that the, the scary part about that is you can't cold turkey that. Mm-hmm. So if you cold turkey that, you will get flu symptoms and you're going to be sick and basically non-functional. So I have like, you know, extra supply. I have a taper amount. If the earthquake hits and I can't get the Vons, <laughs> then, then, you know, I have enough that I could taper it down and still be useful in crisis. Yeah. Because that's one way I'd define fitness. Mm-hmm. It's, oh shit, there's a fire. Oh, I got a foam roll first. No, <laughs> we're going to go do it. I broke my leg. I don't give a fuck. I'll same side stride, mm-hmm. right? Because that, that's what I like. Like Encima is, you have one of the most aspirational physiques and personalities. Like you're just, God smiled when they made you, <laughs> when he made you. You know, and, I, and, and anybody who knows you, You'd have to admit this, and I'm straight, so don't anybody get no questions. <laughs> I'm straight as they get, and I'm conservative. <laughs> oh. Oh, I ain't playing a lot of funny stuff. Like I'm happy being real vanilla. <laughs> but um, but so so I look at that, and you. you you don't have the same natural gifts as him, so that's why you work so hard, right? You're a hard worker, and we're both East Coast, and perhaps that's why you're such a influence in my life. And what I pride myself on is I have mentors who are younger than me. I consider you a mentor. Thank you. I appreciate that. For me. And, it's, it, it, and it, you make my life a lot better. That's great to hear. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Um, what are some other things that have really helped your your mental health what, what, uh, to make a, the yeah. shift? And now it seems like you're you're enjoying a lot of success. I think you're just getting started, really. Yeah, I think yeah. there's still right. a That's, lot more yeah. Yeah. Uh, exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, physical exercise and uh, skill-based physical exercise for me because mm-hmm. I did the, you know, the bigger, faster, stronger stuff with such intensity where I wouldn't go on a vacation to the Grand Canyon. Because, oh, you're going to miss two leg days? <laughs> you realize I'm going to be like seven pounds shy of where I need to be, <laughs> you know, playing football. So the skill-based exercise where there's something, and that's the jujitsu, right? Yeah. The martial art, the study of that, being effective and getting better without a upper limit. It's just an asymptotic limit where you're going to, there's always the possibility that you can get even better. Now there's a diminishing return, you know, from white belt to blue belt versus, you know, black belt with, you know, 10 stripes or whatever to red belt or whatever comes next. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like that might be harder transition to get to Mm -hmm. because the gains become finer and finer. But I think that that, uh, really makes me feel, um, 
it just, if you give someone too much free time, they start worrying about shit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If your schedule's busy and you got shit to do and then you're getting better at something, well, okay, you're tired and you go to sleep. You have a nice dream, you wake up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, and also my children. Like the recognition, <laughs> I'll do anything for my kids. I mean, to a fault. You know, I spoil them. And like, I have to be sane and responsible mm. and capable. Otherwise, what am I doing to them? Mm. And you want to splash me with cold water and wake up, you ain't going to do weed no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So those, th- those two things do a lot. Um, relationships with people who they might even do pot, right? But my relationship with them helps me stay grounded. And I don't care what they do mm. as long as it's not sort of, if, if they have the positive personality, right? Mm-hmm. And they're a brother or a sister, you know, like where you feel a kinship and you feel like a sense of community and purpose, that helps me stay very grounded. Mm. You know what so I mean? So talking about these uh, pattern recognitions, uh, Andrew, can you bring up uh, some clips from his Instagram you had uh, recently, you showed some uh, like old school tribal members. It's that one there to the right. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a still photo. I think some of this uh, is interesting. You see the guys with their feet pointed out. Mm-hmm. and We may have heard different things from various people and, and stuff like that. So what are some of your thoughts about, I don't know, just the way that the way that people should walk or the way that people should stand and, and what capacity should we have or what we should be looking at? I think fight and flight are, that's the two sides of the same coin. And I always now think both sides utilized. So it, it's not that one is better. The change is the constant and the, the transition is where it's at, right? So to say like, oh, well, they always have to be this way or they always have to be that way. I think that's just fundamentally wrong. It's not accurate because depending upon the activity and depending upon the person and their own individual you know, idiosyncrasies. So the toes turned out standing is facilitates down and up more complete than the toes straight and the toes in, okay? And vertical displacement is my first priority. And if I am here like this with the toes turned out, I am more reactive to the sides than if I am in here straight or in. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So... Fight is the first thing because locomotion is not just how fast, how far, how long. It's can you get there in the face of opposition and can you stay there in the face of opposition? So I thought it was interesting that all those magnificent, you know, warriors who who are able to, you know, provide and protect with sticks, right? Mm-hmm. They can catch food and they can protect their family and they can with that. Mm-hmm. There's no iPhone, right? They don't right. call the ambulance, right? You know, it's just not that where it is. It's interesting that that is their resting posture in that standing position. And then with the with the one who's hunting the fish, if you're creeping up on something, that you can be more silent yeah. if you come in and you come in with that open, mm-hmm. right? But he's heel striking. Yes, but that but he's rolling through and he's right. so your heel you're to be calm. Yeah. Here's what it is. I, I, I sort of say that, uh, that you have seven balls in the front of the feet because I'm counting the two sesamoid bones underneath the first metatarsal. Mm-hmm. So you have five and then the two little sesamoids that act as like a lever on the big toe, right? Yeah. And then the heel is the eight ball. You're going to dunk a ball, two-footed jump. You're going to slam on that heel. You stop everything and boom, you turn horizontal into vertical. You set up that other leg. It's like, it's fork and knife. It's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the ball and the bat, the pitch and the hit. Mm-hmm. So the handedness of one helping the other, the heel is a huge factor in movement. So this idea that you never want to be in your heel, like what are we talking about? And why are we saying it? Like what the hell are we talking? Look at basketball. You're using your heel. Look at skateboarding and surfing. You're putting weight in your heel. Yeah. Right? It's, it, it's just, so realism and, and, 
you know, Mike Tyson, you all got a good plan to get punched in the nose. All right, well, let's deal with getting punched in the nose. Let's not just make a plan without factoring that in. So, and it's interesting, the old military knowledge, right? They used to do Indian club kind of stuff. They used to do calisthenics where it's about getting over a wall. It's about monkey bars getting there as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, where everybody, they weren't jacked and stuff, but they were lean and mean and they could move a lot better than the average mean today. Mm -hmm. Okay. When they line them up, the painted footprints are turned out. Because why? If you're a soldier in my army, you're going to stand there, you're going to know vertical, and you're going to know flank, flank. And you can always just rotate and pivot the back one, now you're turned in. Right? So the, in the WEC method logo, it's up and down. Right? That's yeah. gravity. That's where and when. That's the constant. Right? I can build on something if it's the same. The North Star is the North Star. If it changes, I don't know where I am. So that vertical, and then the the... Outward is that wrapping. You get the supination, the pronation, the external torsion, the internal torsion, and that's why I drew the logo. Mm -hmm. I created that logo as a meaning for that. So the primitive is just a look back to when it mattered. Your physical prowess was literally what defined whether or not your family lived or not. Yeah. And the cue that I like to use is up the stakes. Who's going to eat tonight? Play it again. You didn't eat yesterday. Who's going to eat tonight? Play it again. You got kids. Who is going to eat tonight? If we're on a boat and we don't eat for five days, you look like a hamburger and I look like a hot dog. I'll door dash you. <laughs> Get it shipped to me. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so eating mm -hmm. in the Chinese acupuncture meridians, the 12 meridians of the organs, it starts with the lungs. Okay? The breath. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, right? But guess where it starts, that meridian? In the stomach. What's the key to a man's heart? The stomach. We all got to eat. Yeah. My gut says. My gut says. <laughs> exactly, right? Where's all that serotonin and where's mm -hmm. all that stuff? It's in the gut. My mm -hmm. gut feeling. You hear people say that, right? You feel it yourself. We've all had a gut feeling where you just, whoa. Like, I got a gut. I'm going to cross the street. I like this other clip, too. Andrew, can you bring up uh, David was showing um, a long jumper um, from years ago. Oh. Was it Bob Beeman, maybe? Yeah, Bob uh, Beeman. Yeah. This one right here? Yeah. You might want to have some of the audio. Or actually, he could just explain what, what he's seeing here. This so is, like, really I, interesting. I, I did one from the front of Bob Beeman, and then this one's from the back of Bob Beeman. So basically, what I was saying here is that this outward heel flick where the, where the heel flicks out, it's basically a ricochet reaction of a connective tissue recoil to an inward pronating spinning force. And so it's, it's, you're not pivoting because pivoting is fight. Pivoting keeps you in the same spot. So you're, you're not hitting with your toes and then, and then twisting or spinning. Correct. Because you're, you're, you're going too fast. You're, you, well, here's what happens. You hit with the outside ball of foot it comes over to the big toe side, inside ball of foot, and then your center of mass is shifting to the other side. So this wants to do that, and so it comes there, and bang, it springs back out. Right. Now, not everybody does that because there's other people, Johan Blake, for example. So what he'll do, or Ricky Henderson, for example, they'll hit, and they'll come up, and rather than spin and pop back out, what they'll do is they'll hit – They'll come to the inside, and then the leg will bing. The whole leg and foot mm. will spring behind the, the, the shin of the right. other foot, right? And when I played track and when I played football, I would get little cuts and nicks on my calves from the spikes, and there'd always be dirt from the cleats on my mm. inside of my calf from the other foot. So my, my way, I don't do that quite as much as I kick, my whole foot comes kicking over more. This is incredible, the way that he goes way off to the side before he does his jump. Yes, and, and, and basically what he's doing is that penultimate is to set up a massive head over foot, boom, onto that right leg. he takes off, that's crazy. And Carl Lewis, I just did a breakdown on Carl Lewis and, and analyzing what he does. So he, Carl Lewis was another right foot jumper. Mm. 
And and Carl Lewis, he's his power stroke when he runs the hundred or two hundred is his right foot. He gets a a pure head over foot. And then on the left foot, that's the quick side. So he's slightly on the inside of the foot, which creates a vector that goes back to the right foot. Mm. And so this is in 1991 when he set his best time ever and his feet are wide in that, in that yeah, race right there. That's interesting. This is in 1984. And watch how he goes over to the right side of the lane because he's head over foot on the right, but he's not head over foot on the left. So what's that do? He's going over there. Oh, he's like running too on too much of a narrow, well, right, like well, too straight. Well, what I would say, no, what he's doing is he's landing with his head inside of the left that that creates a vector to the right. Mm. So if a wide receiver is going to turn to the right, they stab to the left I outside, see. the head's inside, so that you can now use your body weight and go that direction, right? And so, and then this is interesting. Look what he does in the, in the blocks there. He's, he's pivoting the foot to get a, to a position where he can yeah. slice a better angle with the knee. Because in 1984, he was much higher up and a worse starter, and he was always a bad starter. So and he pushes his heel inward and his toes go out, right? Well, he, yes, he pushes the heel inward because that's the extension. It's the mm -hmm. follow-through where it's going to turn the other way, the figure right. eight. So you, the extension is you're stronger yeah. when you press, and the internal is stronger when you pull. And that's the way that the adductors work in a figure eight manner. So it's not just back and forth flex and extension. It's a figure eight. You land with the foot out, you recover with the foot in. You land with the foot out, you recover with the foot in. And there's a figure eight pattern yeah. happening in the shoulders and the hip socket, right? Yeah, everything is figure eight. Figure eight doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. The object in motion stays in motion. You're not seesawing back and forth like this. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a, you know, like even a whip, Right. Somebody on Insta or somebody on uh, Twitter t said, like, okay, well, you know, the core brace is akin to the handle on the whip, so that you know the the whip can move. I'm like, yeah, but what about the hand holding the handle? <laughs> Who whip? <Yeah. laughs> Try and whip and do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, how much you're not going to crack it doing that? Yeah, it's the fluid. It's making me uncomfortable with all this whip talk. Let's yeah. just <laughs> <laughs> go with something else. No, I'm joking. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking around. Pat Roger family, how's it going? Hope you're enjoying the episode. And this episode is brought to you by Merrick Health, the premium telehealth clinic from Derek from More Plates, More Dates. Now, if you've been wanting to get your blood work done or you wanted to get your blood work analyzed by a physician, Merrick has your back on that. And Andrew, can you tell them how to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you guys know exactly what labs you want to get, you guys can load them all up into your cart and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off all labs. But if you're like me and you're not sure exactly where to start, you guys can get the Power Project panel. You guys can head over to MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project and you guys will see a whole panel of like over 26 different labs, everything from head to toe that you're going to need to know what's going on under the hood. And again, to get in on that, head over to MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $101 off of that entire panel. Uh, links to them and all the information down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. So, so when, even when people walk, um, you know, you, you identified this head over foot stuff from watching a lot of sprinting and running and, and maybe even just walking. But, you know, when I talk about it sometimes, I think people are, I don't, I don't even know what people are thinking, but sometimes you know, people might say, oh, you don't know shit about running or you're new or whatever. But I'm just sharing that you have mentioned these things to me. I have implemented them and they feel really good. And they feel, it feels like, and seems like it's working well for me. And then when I do share it out with other people, other people are like, I've been trying that and I noticed that it feels good. Yes. The other thing that I like about it is it just seems to be uh, something to even just play with. So even if somebody is a runner and they already love the way that they run. They love their own pace and the way that they move or whatever. I think all those things are great, but I think it's also just fun to explore. Just try different things. What I would say is that I always want to operate on that Elon Musk first principles physics. Okay. So if you have a system, whether it's a machine mechanical or a biological organism like us, mm -hmm. balance is how you get to optimization. If, if the tire's not in balance, it wears out quick. If you balance it, you get 60,000 miles or whatever you get, right? So balance is the priority. If I, am, if I am moving my body straight and I am in a position where my head is inside of my foot, 
and I freeze the frame, I am in an unsustainable position. An unsustainable position requires that there is some compensatory tension to try to prevent you from collapsing down. And it's so beneath your awareness that it's the, you know, it's the straw that the camel ain't going to feel until there's 10 million of them. You see what I mean? <clears throat> and you're achieving the objective. I walked to the fridge. I got the Budweiser. I opened the door and got the pizza. What's the problem? <laughs> right? But it's not that economy of when I work with an athlete, I'll ask him. I say, okay, when is your next competition? Oh, it's, it's, it's in three weeks. All right. Well, we're going to work after that. Okay, because I'm not the one who's going to put you in no man's land, trying to teach you something too quick. All right, so that's one thing. And then it's, okay, my objective is effortless power. We're going to reduce it so that it's effortless, and that's how we're going to fill the cup. If we start stacking all this stuff on top of effort, well, you know, you didn't take the time to lay the foundation true. Yeah. You'll never build as high. You'll never go as far. And the chance for injury goes way up. And I have a theory, okay? My theory is that this incredible, ridiculous explosion in non-contact injuries with the most athletic people in the world mm -hmm. running along and suddenly they collapse and they need surgery. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> you never see a cheetah do that. You never see a lion just run and just a collapse with a big joint injury. That's happening to athletes like flies. Yeah. And it's, okay, is it the shoes? Is it the surface? Well, it happens on an NBA court when sneakers and smooth. Happens on a football field with cleats and a turf. All right, it's happening in both. All right, so is it that? Well, I don't know. What are they doing in the gym? And since 2007, that is when it became like the declaration that the scientific definition of core stability was a straight braced spine because the proximal stiffness creates distal athleticism. Mm. And all it was was a simple conflation of big bilateral lift strong where there's an axial load on the body where you do want the barrel and you do want it braced and you don't want it to change. Yeah. The squat and the deadlift. And I like squats and deadlifts, so I'm not one of them functional guys, right? Yeah, barbells are bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. be strong, yeah. <laughs> yeah, come knock me over, right? And so they conflated that axial loaded strategy. Jesus, did he injure himself on yeah, that sprint? Yeah, so the, the combine. Um, I didn't see that one. Man, he got hurt. Yeah, man. he's a he's a lineman, but, you know, exactly what uh, you're talking about. String pull, though. Mm -hmm. Man. Well, and who knows on that reason, a hamstring is different yeah. than a joint. Like a joint is, there's no excuse, uh -huh. right? A hamstring could be whatever. The guy drank last night when he yeah. shouldn't have, mm -hmm. right? But we're seeing the non-contact injury all over the place. Mm -hmm. And my theory is that if you are literally, every rep you do is programming the nervous system and creating tissue change, right? So it's both. Right? There's a neural adaptation to the coordination of the act, and then there's a physiological response into the, you know, in relation to the stimulus. Yeah. Okay? And if the nervous system patterning is to squeeze yourself very tight and then resist, like resist a force, all you're doing in a martial sense is you're uprooting yourself. And the number one example of the worst offender in this is the paloff press if you do a pal yes you brace yourself stiff mm -hmm. right you give yourself a mechanical advantage with it close yeah and then you give yourself a mechanical disadvantage to keeping it stiff okay so now just get in that position right mm -hmm. now stick it out right imagine no make yourself stiff yeah and now imagine that there's a force on your hands going that way uh-huh now move now move? Yeah, now move. <laughs> it, what you got to do, you're here, and yeah. I could literally come over and I could push you oh, over. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah, because I'm so stiff. You're just going to push yes, me in that direction. What you're doing, in order to be athletic, it's load, explode. You know what the funniest thing is, is like, 
the easiest people to deal with in jujitsu are like the strongest lifters. Yes! Because they're so fucking stiff that if you move them in one direction or the other, you're going to sweep them. They're just too used to being so rigid. If you move they, one part, the whole thing goes. The whole thing goes. If, listen, I want to be a bag of sand when I'm putting... The reason I have good pressure in jujitsu is because I know my body, and when I get on you... I know how to put it through the toes. I know how to channel it all, and I know how to relax. So you push yeah. on this, nothing else is going. Mm -hmm. The instant you start stiffening, the whole thing moves. And I need to load to explode. Yeah. People say, oh, well, it comes from the ground up. Yeah, but first it's got to go to the ground. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can't forget the antecedent part where it's the load to launch. It's not launch. Even just to launch, it had to go down first. So, by the way, though, when you were mentioning, obviously, squats and deadlifts, you have to brace your core to be yes. able to move that load. I know you said you're, you're, you know, you don't think there's those movements are bad, but were you inferring that people doing those movements too much was leading to some of these non-contact? No, 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 no. It's the conflation. It's the conflation. Of so, what do you if mean? If I like have too much, if I have an axial load mm -hmm. that is a that is a substantial load, okay. Yeah. And I don't do joint damage by going too low or going too heavy that I'm buckling. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am stimulating a hormonal response that cannot be created any other way. Yeah. Strength is pressure management. And it's the pressure that squeezes the pituitary gland. It's the pressure. That's what it is. Why does a lifting suit work? Because it's like putting you in a pressure where you can't go out of it. Mm -hmm. Right? And Donnie Thompson said... The one injury you can't get in powerlifting if you want to go to 3,000 is a hernia. You can break your back and they can fuse it together and you can still lift. You can blow your knee out and you can still lift, right? But a hernia means you can't put the pressure in. It's a car tire with a with the patch that is not going to solve it, mm. right? So the axial loaded lifts are awesome. I like them. They should be a very big, big part of the staple. Yeah. But you need to know how to transition your weight from side to side yeah. in order to make that useful, mm -hmm. right? So as long as you know big cat and useful, and then you do the stuff that's going to give you like that extra. Bolster the system. Exactly. It's both sides. And so what it is, is it's conflating the idea of this stiffness mm -hmm. to something where the force is not axially loading my skeleton. Yeah. If it's coming from the side, stiffness makes me uprooted. And the problem with strength coaches, the number one problem is they got not a clue on the martial art. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, the kid in karate was burning bugs. He didn't talk to girls and he played Dungeons and Dragons. And you know what I'm saying? That's who did karate. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm just saying. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. Right. So the badass played wrestling and football. Mm-hmm. That's uh, toughest kid in the school was the 189 wrestler who was linebacker on a football team. He was the king. Nobody could touch him. All of a sudden now it's like MMA. Oh, he's exposed that wax on, wax off ain't necessarily going to work till well. Yeah. Right? And we'll punch you in the nose now. So a lot of truth suddenly came out. Right? And then me, I was a football guy. I didn't know anything about martial art. Mm -hmm. My idea of a fight was like, oh, yeah? You want to go outside? Oh, yeah, bumping chests. Like, are you kidding me? My daughter could beat you from what I taught her. Yeah. She's going to hit you in the nuts and the nose and bang, big boy. <laughs> <There> you, <go. laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the martial teaches you the truth. There's an old saying that if you do not understand the martial intent in your training, your training lacks sincerity hmm. if it's not martial intent it lacks sincerity it's about keeping the air and the blood going to the brain mm -hmm. that is what it is about and if you kind of like push martial out like let's not even think specific martial let's say like you're a football player yes and let's say that's your martial right yes and if your training doesn't have an intent to bolster that yes why are you trying to deadlift 700 pounds is that going to help you on the field it well, might well well I, I would say set and we still i still have to before you leave i got to show you the deadlift that i do mm. all right the 45 deadlift because it's we're talking about the same thing and it, Got it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's athletic deadlift, and you're going to like it a lot. All right. And 700 pounds, you could manage it in this posture. Okay. And, and it's good for you.
Okay. Right? So I like heavy, heavy, heavy weightlifting. Mm-hmm. Okay? And I think if you do it right, you should be doing it. Yes. If especially you're going to play football. I mean, you don't even have to be that athletic. And if you have a 400-pound bench press in high school, mm-hmm. I'm going to put you as nose guard, right, and try to move him. Right? I don't care if you're athletic or not. You're just a block, and that kid who, you know, was functional and touching his toes, he, he's not going to push you around. Strength is so important. And, and we kid ourselves as coaches. Oh, it's because carryover is what we're after. And if you don't understand how to walk in balance, well, then what the hell are you doing? Yeah, you might have to get creative with your, with your workouts. So Wait, your, but, but no, your traditional mean, deadlift might, might not be the best thing because you're lifting it all the way from the floor and well, it might cause more issue. Listen, A deep it, squat might not be the best thing. Right. Yes, of course. And certain bodies can do it and certain bodies can't. Right. I wouldn't take an NBA guy and say, oh, well, York Barbell said that it has to be nine and a half inches. Okay. Right. Well, that means that, okay, six, seven. I'm sorry, York Barbell didn't build a wagon wheel for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, and it's a bully culture. Like when I was a kid, like if you didn't squat the parallel, get the fuck out of the gym. Oh yeah, get the fuck out You know, of any gym. kind of a, like a, <laughs> like a Ben Johnson or an Asafa Powell quarter yeah, squat. Yeah, Oh, you Or LeBron what? James. Yeah, right. He yeah. Can't, LeBron James can't go parallel. His hips are made for running and jumping and they're not made for, you know, knitting a basket and building a fire and cooking a meal mm-hmm. with his butt on the floor. It's just, okay, it's anatomical at that point. Yeah. Right? So, but it's a bully culture where it was like, God forbid, like you didn't go to parallel. You didn't, def- you didn't go to parallel. Like it was literally, it was a crime mm-hmm. <laughs> where I lifted weights. If you didn't go to parallel, you might as well get the hell out of there. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe that's not the best thing for all people. Some people below parallel is fine. Mm-hmm. Right? So I think, yes, you need to get creative and suit the person because. Unless you're competing in the sport. If you're an Olympic lifter, I'm sorry. You have to go low because you can't get under the bar if you don't. Yeah. So if you're built for it, good. You got to do it. If you're not built for it, well, then foam roll for 10 hours and get your ass low. Mm -hmm. Right? But if if the point of the exercise is to make you better at something else, Mm. which for most of us it is, well, then you accommodate, accommodate, Right? accommodate the resistance, mm-hmm. conjugate the system, right? There's so much useful information that once we tie it together mm. on a foundation that is balanced locomotion, everybody wins. I'm going to do some box squats right after this podcast. Do the yeah. box, north, butthole to North Pole mm-hmm. on the BOSU ball. Try it. It's a very friendly box squat. Can you explain that, please? <laughs> <laughs> so what you just hold away. Right Bosu, on that pole. So the BOSU ball, <laughs> yes. right? Put the BOSU ball up on a pad or whatever. Turn it triangular so that you got the edges. Mm-hmm. All right, so you got your little box, right? Yes. Set up the box so it's, you know, 10 inches lower than where it would be so you can put a BOSU ball on it. Oh, okay, okay. And then put the BOSU ball right at the corner of that triangle there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then North Pole is the top of the BOSU ball. You know where your butthole is. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you sit back. On, you into, sit yeah. back yeah. and you put the butthole on the North Pole, mm-hmm. and then you and you can you can use it strategically now. It's you gentle. can sit and relax. You can sit into it on it, and you up. you can bounce can it a little go, bit. Can... You can pull with them hamstrings. That's really cool. Yeah, like it, and and Joe DeFranco, OG freaking Joe DeFranco. Yeah. Okay, he told me he's like I'm Jersey. Monday is bench day, and it's my favorite exercise. He's like, the only way I can do it is dumbbells on a BOSU ball. Hmm. You try benching on a BOSU ball. Eat it. You like the slingshot? Well, put the slingshot on a BOSU ball because the BOSU ball with them big triceps you guys got, you can come down. You can feel, ooh. It's yeah. like a floor press, and then it gives you a little scoot back up. But it's a floor press where you can come and touch your chest with the bar. Hmm. Because you're up you can enough. Sink, yeah. Yeah, you can cut. You're not oh, locked. you're just arched there. a bit too. Huh? Yeah, and you can be however you can do it however you want it, and it's gentle on the scaps. The scaps have a little bit of a mm-hmm. play and adjust, right? You can set the scaps mm. in where you want, and there's not a restriction to it. Mm. It's working with you. 
The Bosu Ball, though, is a circus act. I know, isn't that? And you're just trying to make money off people. I'm, oh my God, I'm I'm a charlatan. I'm trying to trick people. It makes you weaker. Oh, I'm gonna like, balance like this, dude. Dude, <laughs> you have to understand from my perspective. We need a picture. Like I'll get on the Bosu Ball, and you wear my slingshot, and we'll make funny faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, just for, right, just for all right. the haters, exactly, charlatan right. brothers. Yeah. Well, but but see, and this connected at the hip. So what what I want to do, okay, is I want. To, to round up all the bullies and say, all right, who's the who's the big boys? And you come out in the center of the playground because little Bosu Ball going to school your ass, knock you down in front of everybody, right? And say, no, you don't brace your core stiff to run. Mm. You don't, right? You've been telling everybody to do it. There's hundreds of thousands of coaches out there been brainwashed to believe that you brace your core stiff. Well, I don't, you need core stability before What do you, you think they mean by that? Like what does that mean? Like do they mean like you're gonna hunker down and and no, it get literally tight means like you're it, gonna squat. It the to big try to run? the the biggest the biggest organization in the certification of strength and conditioning coaches is the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Mm -hmm. The CSCS is a requisite. You want to get a job in the NSCA, all right? And on, these are the rules. They've lobbied for the rules. You see now. They own the science because they have the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. And that's where the peer-reviewed papers go. Oh, well, suddenly I'm studying the peer review. Okay, well, you're anecdote. Everything you've done is anecdote, right? Oh, we can see that, but it doesn't matter because it's not a peer-reviewed study. You see, we had 19 soccer players do this for two weeks, and now we know, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so the whole thing is built on this idea that I need to brace my core – so that my limbs can move better and faster and stronger. So literally, the way that a punch is described by the demigod himself, and I'm going to say the name, and I'll say it with respect. I want to bridge the divide, but people just won't listen. Mm -hmm. Stuart McGill. Mm. He is the number one expert on the spine, right? The demigod of core training. And he's the guy who says... You got to brace it stiff and neutral to be athletic. To throw a punch, you need the pectoralis to be anchored so that when it contracts, it's not pulling, you know, it's pulling the humerus and not moving the rib. It's like, dude. That'd be such a weird way to punch. Try well, it'd be a very, pec. it would be a very bad way I mean, to I punch. I know that your pec is activated, but to try well, to like flex let's put it, it this way. <laughs> let's put it this way. With your pec and punching, you want the pec to just get the hell out of the way. Yeah. Okay. You're not punching with your pec. You're like, hold on, let me get a better pec squeeze. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, no, it's 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 actually the lat is the recoil and right. and that and it's so, so the pec is soft on a punch, mm -hmm. unless it's like you know unless it's that kind of a punch like a Mike Tyson upper mm. where he's coming here. Then yes, then there's going to be tension in it. But if it's a if it's a cross, Deontay Wilder biggest mistake he made when he went and fought uh, what's a Tyson Fury for the last time. Mm -hmm. Was he was bench pressing. Mm. He bragging about, oh, I can bench 350. I can bench 400. Okay, dude, you can't even hit the center line anymore because you made these all big. Yeah. Right? It's just whoever's his trainer and him, they're doing something that is actually counterproductive. Mm. And you see, it is maddening to know the truth, to know it in the cells of your body. Come over and beat me up if you think I'm wrong, right? Like that's the, 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 the frustration of these people, and it's hundreds of thousands of them because it's a bully culture. And intellectual bullying is far stronger than physical bullying. If I'm going to ostracize you from the club so that you can't even work in the college because you're the idiot who thinks that Weck, you know, has something going with head over foot and Bosu balls are not, you know, if you look at it, you're weaker. The estrogen will just ooze into you, right? It's insane, and I want to change that. Yeah. Because everybody's going to win. See, I th the hazing and the bullying and stuff, it had its place. It served its purpose. Right now, what we need is we need encouragement, right? It used to be that the white belts did not roll with the black belts. Go over there and play in your little playground and be bad for a long time before we let you into the club. Mm -hmm. Now the black belts roll with the white belts. They stop midway through and say, yo, you know what? The triangle choke is right there. You see, when I do this, oh, no, yeah, no, no, put, hey, there you go. You feel it? Yeah. That's what we need in the world right now. We need people who are doing this and they're not doing that. To beat up someone weaker than you or prey upon someone weaker than you is a fucking, Jesus. Mm. Really? 
I, we had this Vietnamese kid who moved to our school when I was in high school, and he, you know, didn't speak English, and so now he's learning English. He had some kind of, you know, issue, whatever. Yeah. Kids would pick on him. It's like, what the fuck? I would treat you, I'll jack him on the locker. But you pick on him again, I will fucking break your head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, pick on someone who do, at least it's a fight. Mm -hmm. You pick on someone weak. What the fuck is that? You know what I mean? And then they just pass it on and pass it on. And the intellectual bullying is such that these people are so terrified to think for themselves. And, and, and now, <laughs> why I think this is so serious is because I see society going to hell in a handbasket right now. And if it weren't for people like Joe Rogan, who's going to say it like he believes it, he's going to have an honest conversation. If it weren't for people like that, we'd already be wearing red, you know, marching to Mao and, you know, get on the <laughs> train. to Mao. Holy shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, get on the bus and go to the camp and get in the shower. Oh. <laughs> mm. That's where it inevitably goes. You need life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you can, there was something called Soviet active measures a long time ago. Khrushchev, Kennedy. My great-grandchildren are going to lord over yours, and we ain't ever going to have to raise the bullet and the gun. We're going, to, we're going to subversively come in and corrode the family unit. We're going to erode the faith in God, and two plus four, or two plus two is anything but four. Hmm. And as soon as I sign up for two plus two is five, ho, ho, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. You can no longer win in any argument because you've surrendered logic. And, so, and as, what, I, what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. physical education is the fundamental education is the only realm where bullshit fucking don't work. I can say anything I want to you in SEMA. Oh, I ran a 4-340. I could dunk a ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I dunked yesterday. Oh, well, let's go in and see you do it. Oh, I'm a black belt. Oh, you're a brown belt? I got a brown belt with a stripe. Mm. Okay, well, come into the room and let's play. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of pretending because the pressure is to, you know, oh, I got to be this. I got to be this. We've lost our patience to persist through the difficulty, to defer the gratification, to actually do something real. Oh, how many likes did I get? Oh, yo. You see what I mean? Yeah. And it's destroying society. And I want to go to heaven. I want to look down and I want to see something that's worth looking at. Hmm. You got kids. What's going to happen to their kids? It could be the greatest thing ever. If we can get a hold of artificial intelligence, which is coming, and we can align it with the interests of the human experience and expand consciousness, scarcity can disappear, and it could be fucking Shangri-La on Earth, where now it's about big, strong guys are more like you. They're not posing. They're not imposing, right? They're kind. Mm. And I just, like, the reason I'm so passionate about it is because I actually think I can make a difference. I, like, I actually believe this, that if we can balance locomotion, right, and pass it on, we yeah. eventually don't got to teach nothing. What was it like going to Greg Glassman's Broken Science oh. in uh, Arizona? I love Greg Glassman, okay? He gave me such a warm reception when I met him and I shook his hand. So I went into his house and he was speaking with another gentleman. Like, I saw, you know, you know, at a party, you don't, you, you know, the interruption, you know, like, I don't, don't want to rub you, you, you know, coach, I just want to say hi. What nice to be. He just gave me the warmest reception. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, spoke again the next day at it. On the stage, he told us stories about his childhood and the influence that his father had upon him and how there is no voting in science and how he was given a science assignment from his father to take a micrometer and measure nails. I have a thousand nails and I want you to find me the shortest one and the longest one and you record every single one you did. So Greg goes into his bedroom. He plays with his army guys, comes out two hours later, you know, had fudged it. He comes, he shows his dad. His dad's like, you didn't do it. He's like, yeah, I did. 
<laughs> so in that moment, Greg said that he had both experienced and caused, uh, you know, false science and lying about it. <laughs> so his father sent him back in again. He tried it again. He pulled the blinds. He's like, well, he must have been watching me. Mm. He dicked around again, came out. Son, you didn't do it. Bring the bag out here. So they did it, right, with a bunch of them. He sent them back in, and they actually did it. And what it did was it created the perfect bell curve of the standard mean and, and deviation from the standard so that, you know, your longest one is here, your shortest one is here, and the average mean creates this beautiful bell curve, which is basically the way that, you know, distribution of randomness happens, okay? And that, and his father would watch TV with him, and he would say, you know, nine out of ten dentists say, and, and he would come, he'd turn the volume down on commercially, say, I don't want to hear what the nine say, I want to hear what the one says, huh. right? There's no voting in science. And so Greg has assembled this, like, just all-star team of people who feel just as passionately and just as rationally, and they're just fed up with the bullshit, right? And the thing that I thought was, like, they're working against money interests where how are you going to really move the needle when it's the money, right? Yeah. The realm that I'm in and you guys are in, physical fitness, there's no money in physical fitness. We're talking big pharma. We're talking, you know, big food. We're talking, you know, billions and billions of dollars of exercise science. It ain't got money unless it's got a golf club or a bicycle that I can sell you. Right? That's the only place where the biomechanical put Lance in the, in the wind tunnel. Let's, let's change his helmet. Oh, okay, great. We cut a tenth of one half of a second off his time. Or Tiger Woods. Okay, well, you know, we're going to do it. We're going to sell the golf club. Well, this one costs 1200 because you can't drive, but now you can. Mm. Walking? Squatting? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you won the powerlifting championship. Great. Yeah, I got to go to work. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not retiring on a powerlifting accomplishment. There's no money in it. So that gives us a chance. In exercise, we have a chance because we're not fighting the money. And we can actually create a change where we can create a unification in the exercise system. Where your first reflexive response isn't to say, oh, Zumba, that fucking quit. No, oh, fuck that. Yeah. You know, oh, you fucking yoga. Like, fuck that. You know, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> It's, it's we should look at it and we should be encouraging to people because we feel good about ourselves, not because we've been bullied into a submission where we, you know, got to make fun of the thing as a reflex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Uh, and we, I don't know if we really delved into this on the podcast before, but you do a lot of stuff with the ropes. Yes. And one thing is when people see the rope stuff initially, like a knee jerk reaction is like, what the fuck is that? Like, why are they playing around with ropes? What do you mean? What is this? You know, what is this thing? Correct. But the interesting thing, and I was finding this as I was doing it more is like, if you want to, if to actually get the hang of some of those movements, your spine has to move well. You can't just do this with your arms. Correct. Your spine has to lead it. And then when your spine leads it, boom, it starts to click. So what does the rope train? It trains spinal movement. That's what it trains when you get the hang of it. It creates, it's two tin cans that can suddenly communicate with one another. That's my best video in terms of performance. They said I look like freaking Doogie Howser. Which and, <laughs> and, and the thing, too, is uh, anyone can do it. Anyone. Yes, you could have a, a fake knee that you can't even walk on, and mm -hmm. you can still do that. And what it's doing is it's integrating everything. Jumping rope is syncopated. That's float. Yeah. Okay? Rope flow is unified beat. That is sting. It ain't a bumblebee. It's a wasp that keeps on stinging. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. And anyone can do it. And the integration that you get is second to none. And the level of coordination, that's the coordination of a person who could juggle 10 balls. Mm -hmm. But it's attenuated to a rope so that anybody can ramp up to it. Yeah. And if you want to be more badass for real, learn those four patterns and make a muscle memory. And then suddenly you will acquire all other skills faster, mm -hmm. right? And you now have an integration where you move yourself like a big cat because you become the big cat mover. Yeah. And the rope will never lie to you either. Honey, do I look fat? That's a mm -hmm. diplomatic situation. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. The rope is going to say, I'm going to smack you in the head. You do it wrong. And that's that, that's one of the really cool things about it because as we were talking about, you know, maybe athletes starting to focus, let's say, too much on the weight room or too much on something else that might be not helping them with their sport. 
you can lift. If you add something like the rope in and maybe build that skill, that that's something that can add in to a big way in terms of the way you move. Instead of checking the Instagram between sets, pick up the goddamn that's, rope and do it for 30 seconds. Yeah. You know what I mean? At a very low amplitude. So it's just... Breathe through your nose and do that for 30 seconds, mm -hmm. right? Aggregate that. What will happen in a month is now you can start to know patterns. And now, if you want an intense burst, well, you can now program the rope as an intense modality. At first, just use a warm-up, recovery, cool-down, off day, mm -hmm. right? Boom, that's it. And then once you get proficiency with it, oh, I want to spike my heart rate up to 200. Okay, put on the metronome and see how long you can keep up. Yeah. Right? What got you into ropes in the first place? Like, how did you discover that? I, I was 2004. I was presenting in New York City with an invention that, that it became the ballast ball. And now, it, it, back then, I called it the DSL ball, the dynamic stabilizing load. So it's a stability ball with weight inside of it, so it didn't roll around. And I helped a kid learn how to walk again by using this thing because he could bounce up and down off the wall, off the ball, and it didn't move. And so I was teaching that, and Buddy Lee was there doing his jump rope. And I met Buddy, and I also had that bullet trainer thing. I showed Buddy that, and he, Buddy gave me one of his speed ropes, and I watched him perform, and I was like, wow. Like, there's something to that. That guy can move. And this guy is, you know, world-class wrestler, mm -hmm. right? And so what, what I did was I got home on the plane. I got home 11 o'clock at night to San Diego from New York. I had his rope, and I went out in the backyard, and I said, I'm going to spend 30 days, and I'm going to get just like Buddy Lee. And so as soon as I started, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not going to jump through this damn thing because all the fancy stuff is not jumping through. And then I can always add the jump in once I know the fancy. Yeah. And I remembered in high school that I lost vertical and I lost speed when I jump rope for 20 minutes or a half hour. I would mm -hmm. jump rope for half an hour. And suddenly I'm not as fast and suddenly I'm not jumping as high. So I'll stop that. Because it's low amplitude, you know, a ton of reps and stuff like that. It's for quick feet and changing your feet without changing your center as a boxer. Yeah. Right? So I can change. I can be in a power. I can, boom, I'm suddenly in a power stance. Boom, I'm suddenly in a knot. And I didn't even move, but I moved. Mm -hmm. Right? But this, it forces you to rotate and you don't get tired. Yeah. It's just like you just get energized. And now it's like you don't even feel like working out. Oh, I'm stiff, man. You go out there and you go slow. You put on the song you like, and then before you know it, three, four minutes, I'm ripping, roaring, ready to go. Nice I created, lubricated. I created this storm of balance in the electrical frequency of my brain, the harmony in my brain from the motor sensory cortices, mechanically balancing one another because these are the smart organs that feel and do, mm -hmm. right? So boom, boom, boom. You start coordinating them, boom, coordinate them, boom, boom, boom. Suddenly you're in, a, in like a, in a flow state. So you learn whatever you're learning better and the muscle fucking memory. And so I had studied Wing Chun in New York City when I was 26 years old. And the instruction was like, okay, line up, line up, chain, chain punches to the, to the sternum. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, that's good. You know, put your hair in a tonsil, do a bonsai. What the fuck is that? Uh -huh. <laughs> right? The guy's showing you, he don't know either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as soon as I felt the rope, ah, oh, tonsil, bonsai, oh. Right? <laughs> so I felt it. <laughs> it's like I can program myself. <laughs> and I want to feel comfortable with a man your size who is not friendly. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want to feel comfortable. Like, okay, like I, if I can't beat him, I can at least defend myself and get away. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I could. Yeah. And the rope was what gave me that capacity as the foundation. And it's turned into a movement, it's worldwide. And it, all it takes is enough cool kids in the class. And to remember the first time I met you, I came mm -hmm. in here and I was just, I walked right up to Mark. I said, Mark, you're the pivot point. Mark, <laughs> Mark, like, you know, big dog turns into big cat. Wow, that's a story that doesn't happen. Mm. Find me the guy who squats a thousand pounds, right? And then find me him walking like, bang, oh yeah, right? Doesn't happen. So you have an audience that, you know, who's going to listen to me? I'm skinny. I do a rope. I have a sissy little BOSU ball. Yay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Perception's reality. So I'm a, you know, I'm a charlatan. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a skinny little runt. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the perception. Bang. And that's the way you, you zig when everybody's zagging. Profit in prophecy. Babe Ruth points over the wall. 
it hits the next pitch, that's badass. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And what I'm saying is I'm saying, guess what, guys? The entire paradigm shifts. Gretzky said skate to where the puck is going to be. The puck is spinning right on Weck Method. Because I'm the guy who said head over fucking foot. And it is literally that simple. Because in order to have a worldwide global movement, there has to be no barrier to entry, no cost, no time delay. Head over fucking foot for 21 fucking days. Boom, set it and forget it. And if, if other people around you are doing it and people are acknowledging it, you watch 958 get beat. You watch 958 get beat once these guys actually understand, holy fuck, I can hit the open toe. Oh, okay. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You start training with intent. Intent is everything. Do you think there's any sprinter right now that can? Yes, Fred Curley can if he Fred gets training. Yes. Okay. Fred Curley could definitely beat 958. Yeah, he's unreal. But yes. And he does a lot of natural things. However, and this is not a slight to his trainers and stuff, I guarantee you he is doing exercise that is not just a waste of time, but is actually counterproductive. I guarantee it. Mm. And there are drills that he's doing where he is just not optimizing the drill because he doesn't know the intent. If you know the intent, I mean, think about how much more efficient your time is and how you can aggregate one workout upon another workout upon another workout when you know what you're trying to do. What about the guy from Italy? Oh, Marcel Jacobs. Yeah. Yeah. He, listen, that guy is doing stuff that nobody else is doing. He's running behind those cars he's and stuff run, like that. He's run, and what, think about that. You ex, if the nervous system goes there, it's a lot easier to get back there. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, he's using, you, he's using like basically slingshot technology. That's, that's Fred Curley right there. And, and, so, and Fred Curley rings his wrist. Now, they all, a lot of them do different things in different races. But the mo, for the most part, Fred Curley it's goes ridiculous. like this. He pulses like this. He does that. When you do that, I get an elbow higher easier. Mm. And I get an accelerant on the, he on make, the pulse. He makes a fist and, and pushes his knuckles towards his forearm. It's, and, and the technicality of like it. Like throttle. It's, well, let's put it this way. It's the fourth finger and the thumb. That's the axis of that, of that mm. action. If I do that and I do that, that gives me the greatest power and, and range of motion. He's flying. That dude that's a, in last place, I feel so for Fred, him. <laughs> Fred, I feel like he's tired. Fred Curley. <laughs> so Fred Curley, he is... Sub 10 in the 100, right? Sub 23 oh. in the 200, and sub 44 in the 400. Wow. So he, he is a guy who could do it. Marcel Jacobs could possibly do it. I think uh, Chris Coleman could do it. Trayvon Brumel could do it. There's a whole host of people who could do it. Andre DeGrasse might do it. They need like a perfect day. Now, in this, in this particular race, he's open-handed, Right. So in this race, he's running different than what he ran in, in the previous race mm. because they're not thinking at that level of detail. His mouth isn't even open. <laughs> so relaxed. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, so relaxed. relaxed. Well, and, and, and that, that was probably a qualifying yeah, run where he didn't chilling. have to because that's another myth is that you can't run fast with, you know, like this. You watch Maurice Green. <sighs> you Making watch Usain. face. It, Depends on the distance. Mm. If I'm going 800 meters, well, that ain't going to help me. But if I'm doing my God's honest best to not slow down at 80 meters and I am slowing down, right? Boom. This can be useful. Yeah. Right? So it, there's so many just people don't do their own homework. They get just say, like, if you actually watched the video, you'd see it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And it's like you're just taking somebody else's word for it because they put on a PowerPoint and you paid them money for your little, you know, CECs. Oh, okay. Well, he must know what he's talking about. What the fuck is going on here? Power Project family, your normal shoes are making you weak. This is why we partner with Vivo Barefoot Shoes because they have a wide toe box, they're flat, and they're flexible. So with every single step you're taking, if you're taking a 10 minute walk outside or when you're working out in the gym, your feet are able to do what they're supposed to do in this shoe. 
They have tons of options for hiking, running, training in the gym, chilling and relaxing, casual shoes for if you're out on a date. You need to check them out. And Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. And you guys will receive 15% off your order automatically. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. <laughs> what I noticed about the head over foot stuff when I'm running is that I can run safer. Like that's the main thing for me Yes, is that like if I want to run faster and if I want to sprint or pick up some good speed, <coughs> it feels way safer to me. It's because you're, you don't, you're not gripped by the compensatory tension of imbalance. If there's imbalance, God made it that way. You're not going to fall down. Right? Your body's going to do whatever it takes to not fall down. And so, and that shit's reflexive. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's a, it's a little grind. It ain't smooth. And like, okay, but you don't even know it. Right? What, what tipped me into this was the Feldenkrais training. Feldenkrais is a somatic form. It's a complement to Rolfing, structural integration. Mm -hmm. Feldenkrais was functional integration. And so basically what he did was have people lie down on the floor and do like simple tiny movements to be able to feel the different gradation of force to find what feels good. Like slow that shit down. Take all the effort out of it and feel, oh, that doesn't feel good. Oh, well, if I do that, it feels good. And just follow feels good, mm. right? And if you don't reduce it down, if you, he would use it, there's a, there's a, a Weber-Fechner law that, you know, you're only capable of discerning a 10% differential. So if a thousand light bulbs are on in the ceiling and two of them go out, you don't know. But a thousand light bulbs, 50, you don't know. A thousand light bulbs, 101 goes out. Oh, it got dimmer in here, didn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was dimmer when two were out, too. You just couldn't feel it. So what if you're walking around with two light bulbs that are out? You know what I'm saying? I don't know the difference. I don't care. All right. Well, wait till a bunch of them burn out from that, and now you got 400 of them out. Oh, and I got a problem. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's just, this is common sense that's not common. And it's, I just think it's because, I don't know, the prizes, and I, I was with Tom Myers last night. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we spent two anatomy hours. Anatomy trains, right? Yeah, anatomy trains. So Tom Myers and I are going to be collaborating on a special project. Whoa. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Can you tell us what part of what it is? Yeah, right? yeah. Basically, basically, he wants to, he, he is, you know, sort of a huge fish in the pond of body workers and people who manipulate, you know, with their hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, best of the best kind of a guy, right? And he's had some impact on the exercise and fitness world, but it's almost like it went and then it sort of ebbed off. Oh, fascia. Remember when fascia, if you didn't say fascia, you weren't cool, right? And suddenly you had to say fascia, right? And he had to say anatomy trains. You had to say spiral line. You had to say these things. Well, you don't have to say those things anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? They've just sort of gone out of vogue. So it's basically... He does this fresh frozen dissection where the body, it's the most hydrated dissection in the history of humanity, not since they were digging up a fresh body and cutting it open. And this is even fresher because the person has expired, put them in the freezer, thaw them out, let's cut them open and see what's inside. All right. And I was privileged enough to go do this in person. So I was invited to this thing years back. And let me tell you something. Some people have 13 ribs, okay? I'm just saying. Yeah. Some people have a muscle that you don't know the name of, mm -hmm. right? Some people don't have a pec minor. I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, we're same, same, but we're different. And some people have adhesions that you can't even find the subscapularis. You've heard that word? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, some people have an adhesion where you're like, what the hell is this? Mm. Well, let's cut it. <laughs> let's keep cutting it. Keep cutting. Oh, that's where the subsapularis is. Yeah. See what I mean? So you're finding out what is actually inside because the anatomy books and the apps that are amazing, that's a mean average, right? Oh, it is this. Well, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to do these events where he gets to show trainers who care about being next level, look, you're targeting this. We're going to clarify your intent. So now that you are going to see 
the acetabulum. You're going to see what an arthritic bone looks like. You're going to see it because we're going to take it. And for the first time since, you know, the Chinese medicine is also Chinese martial because the way that you find out what a liver is is some guy got slashed open and there's this big thing and now that's a liver. Yep. And then you compare it to an animal and say, okay, great. You see what I'm saying? So this is literally hearkening back to you're, you're going to, into the interior space like we've never done it before. And Tom Myers is the best person to do it. He's teamed up with the guy who does it the best. And so he has all this information to share. And he selected me to be the conduit to bring it to fitness. Sick. Isn't that great? Yeah, that's fucking awesome. So we spent two hours last night and like I... <laughs> I went to a liberal arts college, okay, mm -hmm. and I graduated with honors. So, like, I got a geeky brain, too, and I can appreciate high intellect and batting it back at that level. And I, I even said the word I used to describe it last night because he brought another guy, Dave Kennedy, who's just like, oh, my God, you're like my friend. I need your reading list, please. Mm. I told him, I said, this has been delightful. Like, that was the, <laughs> that was the word. It was delightful. delightful. It was so delightful mm. because it was. Yeah. You see what I mean? And wouldn't it be nice to be in a world where delightful isn't automatically on the sissy scale? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's fun to laugh at and we should, right? But, but we can progress beyond. Like you see somebody with a rope and you're like, ah, a little sissy. Like, come on now. You see what I'm saying? Or the uh, <laughs> no, <I was> propulsors <laughs> shaking. Yeah, you know? exactly. Oh, a little Moroccan. Oh, you know, that bullshit. <laughs> salt and pepper. You know what I mean? It, and it's dismissed out of hand. And it's, it's, I don't know. I think having gone insane four times, it, it, there's an ego check. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's such an ego check that I don't care. You want to make fun of me for being crazy? Go ahead, baby. Like, I got God's honest equanimity when it comes to that. And perhaps my courage can inspire you to dig down deep and say, you know what? Maybe I do need a little help in this arena to be a lot better as opposed to posing and pretending that I'm strong when I'm not. What are the pulsers trying to show to people? What are they trying to cue? So basically what we're doing with the pulsers is we are gaming physics. Okay. So momentum and inertia. Hmm. Okay. So. G give me that kettlebell right there. Yeah, here we got some right here. G oh, this is one. Yeah. Thing. Right, so, okay. Mm. So, this is one pound. This is 16 ounces. This is 12 ounces, mm -hmm. okay? If I take this, this is a solid weight, all right? When I create momentum, there is an inertia here. Inertia means that that's the object in motion wants to stay in motion, Right? And so it's hard to slow down if it's solid because all that momentum yeah. creates the inertia that, oh, I got to like, oh, I got to work, right? As soon as we shift the weight, now, for I'm creating momentum. I'm creating inertia. Mm -hmm. But when I stop, I don't feel the inertia until the inertia hits. See what I mean? Yeah. So we're talking about, if we're talking about power, Right, it's the force divided by the time multiplied by the distance. That's the formula in physics for power. Force divided by time. So what this gives me is this allows me to take time in the denominator and make it a very small value, milliseconds. Tiny value. Maybe we're out to the third decimal. I don't know. But I can take 12 ounces and mm, I can turn it into 45 pounds for that long. So my time under tension, if I add up, you know, let's say it's a, a, a thousandth of a second, mm -hmm. right? Two thousandths of a second. That means a thousand reps is two seconds under tension. Oh, really? Huh? Okay. So boom, boom, boom. I can move this fast. And it's like going to the doctor and he hits the, he hits the kneecap or the patella and bing, and there's a reaction of the connective tissue. So because I can change direction on a dime, the amortization phase is exponentially shorter with a shifting weight than a solid weight. And that's why this thing hasn't been invented yet. The patent I have on this is ridiculous mm. because I specify it out. The theory of operation is outlined to the millisecond because that's the only way it works. And if somebody had figured this out, we'd all already be doing it. 
And we'd have the ones with the springs and we'd have the sensors, and you know, and it'd be like, oh, bing, bing, bing. You even said it yourself. You predict the time that people will prefer to run with them than without them. They won't be maracas that make a lot of noise. They're going to be spring-loaded with a sensor and a little ring clip on you. And you can still, maybe you talk on it too. Maybe it's a phone. Something on your wrist or phone, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is it, but that takes development. Mm -hmm. And I'm the organic guy who, I don't take money. See what I mean? Like, I haven't taken money. We can talk about that later. <laughs> but historically speaking is I'm a family business and every penny that I spend is a penny that I have earned because I'm beyond the, you know, I've already paid back the initial investment. Everything that I operate on is profit. And that allows you to maintain control. Because if you take $25 million, well, guess what? Four years later, you better be ready to, you know, do that. Otherwise, you know, we're going to remove you, right? And I will never be Steve Jobs out, out of my company. It just won't happen, right? So... The, the way that that works is I have speed. And so I'm getting the audible feedback, yes. And that is very important because audible organizes better than anything else. Yeah, and it's probably important that people know that running is uh, down and up, right? Like you're shoving down into the ground. It's load explode. There's three phases to the land. To the ground exchange, there's three phases. There is the landing, the loading, and the launching. Land, load, launch. Land load launch. And to do it well, you want one peak load. You don't want two. And that's why they say don't heel strike and create a big load that you're not using to launch. Because if, if, if the landing is too abrupt and I load, well, now I can't harness it to launch. Yeah, and maybe overextend a bit. The foot's out in front Right, too exactly. Much. So you, now you have a bad mechanical advantage and everything just in terms of the, the leverage of moving forward. But... So, so the landing has to be in that proper proportion where you're landing on the outside and you're setting up the strong integrity. Yeah, I mean, you can see it there. And like, if you see that and you tell me that you can't see what he's doing, you're lying to yourself. I mean, look at, look at the football. Boom, boom, boom. This Boom. is uh, what you refer to as a double down, right? Where double down. I mean, elbows are completely uh, to the side. Well, I mean, just I mean, Daryl Green. Half a second. What it is is you're 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 going down in both directions. So it's less. Don't think forward, backward. Think up and down to to augment the forward, backward. So Michael qu Jordan. Question about this is that is like is seeing this pattern. The, how you ended up making this? Yes. The, yes. So here's what happened. Ricky Henderson's got great glutes. Mm -hmm. And Ricky Henderson don't flick his heels. Mm. Ricky Henderson had such strong hamstrings. Look at that. That's a base stealing technique that I created that is happening in Major League Baseball mm. with the athletes that are sophisticated enough to realize, like, holy shit, I can get eight inches faster to second base mm. from just technique. I'm faster than Billy Hamilton for the first eight inches, and then he passes me, <laughs> right? But hey, doesn't sound so bad. I can give you eight inches, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds interesting. <laughs> right? There's Alex, right? Mm -hmm. In the lab. Here's a kid, and the cue was pretend you just hit a home run. So when you hit a home run, that's like one of the only situations where running is not punishment. So if you, if you pause it at a particular moment, you'll notice that both elbows are completely by the person's side. Well, it depends. Yes. Yeah, so, so, well, some, some do it with the elbows and, uh, and slower motion. There tends to be more of a bend. Some people like Marcel Jacobs and they go down with the hands coming down. Oh. Dion came with the hands. Randy came with the hands. Usain Bolt comes with the elbow. The important thing is that the upper quarters are both working working together to create ground force vertical and the side, the ipsilateral side is the one that would, it's just opportunity sitting on the table, ready to grab because it's the ipsilateral. And this, that's from a guy who says you got to brace your core, right? That's, that's from a guy who says, Oh no, Weck don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. You put a lacrosse stick in her hands and guess what she starts doing? Boom, Boom. Yeah, that's, know, that's as natural as it gets. Head over foot with a double down pulse. The sickest thing about the pulsers is that with many of these athletes, this came intrinsically. Like they are, they, yeah, they've they been doing things yes. athletic for the longest time. So their instinct is to move this way. Not everyone's instinct is to move that way. Correct. And this can cue someone yeah. in with the sound of how to move. Well, that and way. it's also, check, check this out. 
Okay, Michael Johnson's a great example of one of the greatest sprinters of all time. Look at him. He's amazing. George is one of my close, dear friends because why? Because he gets it and he does it. Look at that. You can see it. The stick. And a stick is free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carl Lewis made fun of me on Twitter. He said, oh, he's selling a product. Oh, really, Carl? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what I said to Carl, I was like, you, you like your coffee maker? Is that a product? You like, your, you like your track spikes? Are that a product? Sometimes products are good. <laughs> right? Not all products are bad. Yep. Right? Not everybody's a shyster. Right? So what, and, and Michael Johnson, he's one of the greatest sprinters of all time. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this is not a dig personally. Okay? This is, a, this is just an observation of fact professionally. He does not understand the biomechanics of locomotion. He believes that he himself did not move his head. Let's watch the video. His gold necklace. Boom. Double down pulse. You have to watch it from the front. If you don't watch it from the front, you can't see it. It's invisible from the side. Yeah. And the side is how you determine the acceleration angles, the stride length, who wins the race. And to see it from the front requires technology. I need a telephoto lens to watch the 100 meter dash from the front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, wouldn't work. So, and you can't find out who wins the race from the front. You don't even know who's ahead of each other from mm -hmm. the front. So you need, it's again, both sides utilized. Okay. And when Michael Johnson is on the BBC criticizing Usain Bolt for having no technique, he's sloppy, he's collapsing all over the place. He's, you know, he, they're going to fix that by tomorrow and then he's going to run fast. He did that? Yes. It's on the BBC. This Shit. is, listen, internet's forever. And who said what, when? Every, everybody thought he had crazy form. But when but you look at him from the front. Watch when he turns. Then you're like, oh. You see his head yeah, going back yeah, and forth? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do you see that? And uh -huh. look at his arm. Look at his, how high up his elbows come. It's but, weird. He like, looks overextended like his head's way back. Well, but you see, but again, the, the most important thing that you can evaluate in running is faster is faster. Yes. Okay? Pretty pictures, pretty pictures are bullshit. Damn, he's fast. <laughs> yeah, he was unbelievable. Now, okay, so go back to that now. He ran with external torsion, so it's very haunch and glute dominant, right? And the external torsion here helps your foot stay straighter. There's an inverse relationship. So if I slouch like this, it makes my feet turn out easier. Mm -hmm. And if I extend like this, it makes my toes go in easier. And you can feel it yourself. Arch your back and feel how pigeon toe feels suddenly easier if you stick your butt out and your shoulders back and you arch your back. Yeah. Pigeon toed is easier. Mm -hmm. And if you see a kid with cerebral palsy walking, it's always an arch back in the pigeon toe. This is, this is freaking biomechanics 101 we're talking about here. And people are in kindergarten with the biomechanics and they're pretending that they got a PhD. Because for Michael Johnson, he did the correct action. So his coach said, Michael, brace your core. Don't move your head. Okay. Apple. He does orange. Okay, he gets positive feedback. He's the greatest in the world, one of the best ever. So for him, an apple is orange, but then he teaches the other kid apple. And he's not as gifted, so he does brace his core, and he runs slow, and he's not as good as he would otherwise be because he didn't know to squeeze the orange and not the apple. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, and, and the fact that this takes so, look at his, look at his necklace. Look at his head. And if you slow it down, you'll see that he's landing head over foot. Oh, he's just missed a step there. You see that? Mm -hmm. I am convinced that we are going to see every world record break. Yep. You see the necklace? Do you see, you see how the energy goes boom, boom, yeah. boom? Yeah, and there's also, um, there's also a little bit of a pitch of the, the shoulders. Yes, yes, and that's the figure eight. Right. That's the figure eight. That's the one scoop. One shoulder coming down, one shoulder. And what, what happens is when, 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 when the one shoulder comes down and back, the scoop, it, it mechanically raises that side hip. So now your foot is raised higher without the burden of raising your foot. It's the proximal hip. So there, right. there's a great video, too, of the Grakovetsky spinal engine, the guy with no legs, okay? And there's a guy with no legs 
walking upright because he's coiling the core. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing differently than what we do with legs is he is doing an overhand figure eight, which corresponds with the same thing. Because as long as it's because of the, the, the curvature of the spine, a side bend mechanically creates this, this ipsilateral like relationship where shoulder down and back is hip up and forward. Yeah. So whether I get there in an underhand or whether I get there in an overhand, it's the same relationship. Okay. And so what you're able to do is you take your sits bones and you make progress vertically by doing this with your body. Mm. Right. And if I just stand and brace your core and try to lift one sits bone, you can't do it. You got to like tilt and go yeah, way out of balance. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, I mean, it's just like, and you know, the, the, how about those exercises where you sit on your butt and you sort of squirm back and, you know, walk on your butt backward. Yeah. That's a fantastic exercise for core strength, right? Core stability. If you get on a suspension bridge or you get in a skyscraper, if that thing ain't moving and swaying, get the fuck off it or out of it now. Because stiff ain't stable. Stiff ain't stable. That's extremely true. Yeah. Exactly. And the same thing in the biomechanics of the human body, we are not stiff to begin with, right? I mean, you know, there's a couple of ways you could use the word stiff, one in the good sense, one in the bad sense, but as it relates to exercise in your core, you want to pressurize. You don't want to stiffen. Yeah. Right? Stiff to me, you're fluid. Your body's mostly water, right? Mostly water. So what you want is you don't want it to be ice. You want it to be fluid. So stiff is ice. Mm -hmm. There's no yield. It'll shatter and there's no bounce or rebound off it, right? The fluid is how the force transmits through it. And how I came up with this was I had been studying the Chinese acupuncture meridians and I was using that information of each, which each finger relates to. Mm -hmm. And I was spiraling my hands to go from here to here. So I was doing this and then take the middle and envelop it with the outside, just like that. And so what I was doing, and the logic here in SEMA, is that I wanted to move the distal extremity as fast as I possibly could with the least, yes, with the least, that was faster, flick the water off your fingers, boom, that is, you cannot move the hand faster with less effort than what you just did right there. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm talking mass through space. Wham, 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 wham. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> boom, he knocked himself out. So, and I would do uppercuts where I would come right to the chinny chin chin. Mm -hmm. And I go, wham. And that's why I carry my knife in, in, in my, in, right next to my, right next to my button. That's why I carry my knife yeah. here. Cause I used to carry it in my pocket and I hit on a fling oh. that the fucking clip of the knife. I got an infection that practically turned gangrene. I hit it so hard. Oh, yeah, that nice. was bad. So I never carry a knife on the pocket like that. But so I was doing that. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. So I had muscle memoried mm -hmm. my hands to, to do that, right? Floyd Mayweather, Shane Mosley, May 1st, 2010. Mm -hmm. Boxing's my favorite spectator sport. Four punches and it's the sweet science and I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. So I'm watching it, right? Second round. Mosley hits Mayweather and Mayweather's stunned. And I was like, oh, baby, this might be the one. Boom. And my hands went to Mahalo with the triangulation of what I'd been doing. Yeah. And later that night, I closed it down. And I was just like, oh, my God. I felt it. And I was just like, holy shit, this thing is. And Tai Chi, the translation for Tai Chi Chuan, supreme ultimate fist. And what I do is I shadow box on the door jam. So like, you know, bam, bam, you know, I, I, I'm always shadow boxing on the door jam yeah. <laughs> and boning up. You know. Yeah. Second round is when a, he hit him. I remember this fight. This was so good. And I think this is, this is after he hit him. I think he hit him a little earlier like in the round. Really trying to rough him up. Yeah. Because now he's trying to finish him, but Mayweather, mm -hmm. you know, Mosley was too glitchy, mm -hmm. but earlier in this round, Mos, Yeah. I'm, oh, that was where it was. Yeah, I just feel like, man, after this round, though, he didn't put the same pressure on him. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, what happens is Mayweather figures out your timing, and now you're apprehensive to throw a punch because he's timed you. Got you. And Mosley went into this fight extremely nervous 
So he, Floyd Sr. said, you're going to watch Moses. Oh, yeah, he got whacked right he, there. He's going to be. he didn't let go. Yeah, you see? Yeah. And now I'm in my living room going like this. Ah! I'm jumping up. Ah! And later that night, I found it. Now, as soon as I found it, Asima, what happened was I felt, oh, I have that, right? So now I started punching down and jolting myself because tension in the core fist creates fluidity proximal. Mm -hmm. The harder you squeeze a regular fist, the more bound up you get. The harder you squeeze a core fist, it's a skeletal surf circuit, and now this shit's free. I remember when Mark posted that up when you were talking about it. Yeah. So many boxing coaches. And oh, just, bullshit. Just like, nope. Striking coaches were like, no. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Because what could that guy know? Oh, really? You're better than me, but I'm smarter than you. Okay? There you go. Right? Yeah. Ooh, bang. Bang my chest. So oh. when I felt that, I felt the I felt the pulse action, mm -hmm. and as soon as I felt the pulse action, Deion Sanders, Deion Sanders, oh, probably the biggest impact player in sports. Yeah, right. And now I saw Deion, and I and now like you watch his hands, he has that finger extension with hand flexion. If Deion Sanders ever comes on this podcast and you're talking about football, oh, he will. He'll be like, okay, now here's what we're gonna do. The kids are going to behave right, and they're going to get an education, and we're going to win. <laughs> you listen to you a lot of Deion Sanders. I watch Deion Sanders. I love Deion Sanders. Yeah. Deion Sanders is a mentor of mine from afar. Yeah, yeah. Because he was the guy who I recognized as soon as I felt it, I saw him. He was the first thought that I had. As soon as I was like, boom, I'm like, holy shit, that's Deion. And then I tested out. I'm like, holy shit, I got a jolt of force that I never had before. And this is an athletic advantage. Now, I didn't have something to teach it. So you had to train with me and you wanted to really want it to find it. Yeah. Because, you know, okay, how the hell do you have somebody feel it? Athletics is feels. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel it, you can't repeat it. Right? So I taught a bunch of people, you know, boom, boom, boom. Actually, a sprinter at the Olympic Training Center named Lex Gillette, who was running with... Uh, uh, um, Oh, Wesley Williams as his guide. I taught him how to line up with the core fist. Mm. So he's posting up because you can put all your body weight through a core fist. You know, it's a lot stronger than that. And I had them both running with the core fist. And this was, you know, 2010-ish. They ran Lex's fastest time. He's still running. And he ran faster then than any other time proximal to that right after that he ran his fastest hmm. and that was before i was really able to convey convey double down so it was more just like the position and just you know do that yeah and it sort of tends to do it now i have much more in, you know clarity and marty my business partner he's like david you've been saying the same thing since i met you in 2014 and it's just like, okay, here's a 30,000 square, here's a 20, here's a 10. And now it's like microscopic. I know this shit inside out. Mm -hmm. And that's what's allowing me to invent at a pace that I mm. can't wait to have cash flow so that I can create. And then it's footwear and then it's apparel and then it's surfaces. Surfaces. Artificial intelligence is coming and it's going to lay waste to a lot of employment. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah but it ain't going to lay waste to proprietary three-dimensional objects that human beings interact with. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a backlash eventually for some who don't want to live their life here. Let's put on the goggles, man. And, and pretend, right? Yeah. A little dystopic fucking masturbate in your mom's basement. <laughs> really? Really, <laughs> Anyone Mark? you want, man. Really, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> really? Any tension? Any it. warmth? <laughs> <laughs> and not that one. <laughs> the other Mark. <laughs> Andrew, you got anything? Man, I'm trying to catch up still. But no, um, the uh, the propulsors, uh, I remember when I first heard about them, because uh, I missed the first time you were around, um, I, I'll be honest. I was like, what do you mean something that weighs 12 ounces is going to make me run faster? I thought in my head, well, something that would make me 12 ounces lighter might make me faster. But it wasn't until I went running with Mark and he kind of, you know, got me to go head over foot and try some things. And all of a sudden I was running way too fast for my ability to long distance run. 
Um, so it was very eye opening, and now I'm like, dude, David Wex, crazy man. I appreciate him, and he knows what the hell he's talking about. It's amazing. Uh, but why? Why do you? Th- I don't know. Is it your mission to try to convince more people? Because everyone we, we've been everyone. talking about like the bullies, the, the yep. naysayers, the people talking shit online. Why does it matter what they say initially? And are you trying to convince them? Yes. And here's what I want. I want to be Tom Sawyer, right? I want to sit back and let everybody paint their fence and love it, right? So I, I want to be able to get hit by a bus and leave the stage and the shit still goes on, okay? And all you need is a critical mass of cool kids in the class to suddenly realize that the Fosbury flop is superior to the Western role. And in athletics, an advantage is a necessity. That's just the way it is. An advantage, you gonna play soccer without cleats? Really? Mm-hmm. You gonna ice skate without ice skates? You gonna do right? M- MMA without jujitsu? Yeah, right. It just exactly. didn't yes. make any sense at a certain point. Correct. Well, you will lose. If you don't have a takedown defense and an answer, mm-hmm. then you will lose to that bullet. And here's what it is if I were world class, Andrew, nobody would know nothing. Okay, because I would exploit it and I'd beat the fucking crap out of everybody. And then after I would share it. Since I'm B plus and I can't make money playing sports, my best bet is to share it with everyone. And that is my intent. Mm -hmm. And again, I've, with Mark knowing what he knows and with the, you know, the people who you surround yourself with, this thing is inevitably going. I'm just trying to accelerate it. Because it is, it's, it, I guarantee that this becomes the norm in terms of what's training. Head over foot becomes the norm because, again, an athletic advantage is an athletic necessity. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter who I am. Yeah. I could be anyone. I could be an asshole. I could be a nice guy. I could be brown, purple, pink, or whatever. I could identify as anything, and it makes no difference because it is in the interest of the person themselves to to take advantage of the advantage. And that's just a fact. You know what I'm saying? So that is happening. What I want to do is I want to accelerate it and let's start making progress so that we can fight the evil forces that are fucking, you know, you're going to eat bugs and you're going to own nothing. You're going to be happy. Oh, really? Well, I don't think the troops that walk with me and the network of people making every step strong are going to like that. You see what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. Andrew, take us on out of here. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> all right, thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Please drop those comments oh. down below. We gave you tons of stuff to talk about. We want to hear everything. Uh, make sure you guys like today's episode and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already. Follow the podcast uh, at MB Power Project all over the place. My Instagram is at I am Andrew Z and Sima. And Sima on Instagram, mm-hmm. YouTube, and Sima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. David, where can people find you? At the David Weck on Instagram and at the David Weck on Twitter. Weck Method. Does Weck Method have its own page? Yes, Weck Method has its own page and then WeckMethod.com. Got it. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.